I'm Kevin Abdurrahman. My guest today is Pega Baemi. No! <laughs> He's locked out. <laughs> He's laughing. She's the brainchild? No. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, now, even. You yeah. see documentary? Oh, like everyone's great oh. behind the camera. Yeah. Get in front of the camera and do it. Right. You do it how you want to do it. No, no, I appreciate it. You do you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I do that when you say award winning? You should. <laughs> Her body of work is a stock of films. Independent, dependent. <laughs> <laughs> dependent. So many freaking things. <laughs> do you want me to say the rest? Entrepreneur, business owner. <laughs> and an all round awesome chick. <laughs> you better keep that. <laughs> My guest today is an award-winning writer, producer, director, actor, and an entrepreneur. Her body of work is a scope of films, commercial, independent, fiction, and non-fiction. Her films have been selected at many film festivals, such as the Cannes Film Festival, the Clermont Ferrand Film Festival, the Rotterdam Film Festival, the Slam Dance, and the New York Film Festival, not to mention the rest of the world. Her work has been broadcasted on BBC, CNN, Disney, and NBC. She's a jury member at a number of global film festivals. She's the co-founder of the Works Network, founding director of My Film Works, and the founder of the creative production company called Pega. She's the creator of the renowned BBC documentary, I Am Yazidi, which was shot in Kurdistan and Iraq and post-produced in London. Beyond all the great things that my guest is doing, what I really love about her is her unmistakable and uninhibited personality. There is such a great energy about her that every time we meet, we will talk about serious points, but we will have mad laughters together. So when it was time for us to catch up, I thought, let's grab a cup of coffee. And then I thought, you know what? Why don't you actually join me on the YouTube show and podcast? I'd love to have you on. So after a few coffees and a number of failed attempts, here we are. And I'm super excited that she's taken the time to be here because I'm bound to get some gems out of it from what is a gem of a woman. This is How Do They Do It. I'm Kevin Abdurrahman. My guest today is Pega Baemi. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if I can live up to all the stuff that you just said. Of course you can. <laughs> Your story starts with you and a vacuum cleaner. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> How did you know that? Tell us about that. Okay, so... I guess you could say my story started when I realized that I could face my fears. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing more frightening to me than the vacuum cleaner when I was three, four years old. You know, it roared, it sucked everything up, it followed you wherever you went. And after a many, many, many fearful days of watching my mother, you know, I would run around, I would sit on the couch, I would climb the walls just not to be on the same. I away. Yeah, I, I always I always hid away. And one day my mom said, Come. And I was like, No. And she said, Come. I said, No. And then when she turned away and she started vacuuming the other side, I ran and I jumped on that vacuum cleaner and I wrestled it. And it was like <laughs> I'll give you a tackle. Yeah, and I was like, I own you, you know? And then every single day after that, when my mom vacuum cleaned, she didn't do it every day, but every other time that she vacuum cleaned, I sat on the vacuum cleaner. And that was really the first time that I remember really facing my fears and, and knowing how to conquer something that I was afraid of. And not, and my mother reminded me of this story, not, not long ago, after I went to Iraq and all this, and she said, you're that same girl that tackled the vacuum cleaner, which to me was a big monster. It was a demon, it was a devil. <laughs> so yeah, and this continued. And this, this mentality, I guess, continued. And I do try to tackle the things that I'm afraid of most. Was it a reminder she gave you when you were facing a fear? Yeah, it was after I'd come back from Iraq. Okay. After she saw that, after she saw Ayn Yazidi, she said, I can't believe you went through all that. But then she goes, it makes sense. You're the same kid. Yeah. Who went and tackled the vacuum cleaner. The vacuum cleaner, yes. It's weird to think that your story starts with a vacuum cleaner. You're a woman. It's, just, it's a bit wrong. But it, it really did start with a vacuum cleaner. It was horrendous. It was so scary. That's my phone, man. No, I'm kidding. Sorry. 
<laughs> yeah. It was scary. It was horrifying. I mean, if, when you were a kid, you know, some kids are scared of washing machines, like Home Alone, you've seen right, yeah. afraid. For me, it was the vacuum cleaner. You know? Yeah, we all have these fears. And unfortunately, perhaps not everyone deals with it, or they do deal with it when they're kids. You know, we tend to be fearless as kids. Then unfortunately, we grow up. <laughs> which is the reality, right? We grow up, life experiences <laughs> bashes into us. You pack a lot. Yeah. And then you become this fearful person when in reality, okay. yeah, most kids, when you look at them, they're fearless. Then they grow up, life happens to them, and they start becoming fearful of many things. Have you had fear ever stop you from doing what you want? Uh, many times, yeah. I think many times. But it's something that you have to face. So you have to think, okay, I'm afraid, for example, to... Uh, go for this job or I'm afraid to I still have a lot of fears I think we all do I think fears sometimes are not a bad thing as well because they can keep you safe <laughs> so yeah. sometimes we were for example in in a territory where I knew that me the crew and I were unsafe and just by you know an, an inkling I would say okay guys let's just pack up and go sure and then we would realize that you know something threatening was not far away but well, that's fear in, in the sense of protection. Protection. Self-preservation. Yeah. You know, protecting oh, you mean, you mean fear of success? But Because that's a big fear that everybody has. Yeah, yeah, you know, the thing is, what many don't realize, like you come across as a courageous person. You are a courageous person. But people mistake courage with not having fear. Yes. Not it's real. not true. It's not true. I'm a scaredy cat. I'm scared of everything. But kind of like <laughs> a vacuum cleaner, right? Yeah, I'm scared of... Well, so Dark, what, I'm scared of people, I'm scared of lots of things. What makes you tackle, you know, I want to get into your way of thinking. So what makes you decide, okay, this fear is it's there, worth fighting. but I want to go and face it or I want to go fight yeah. it. What, what I are think, you thinking? I think, it's, I think, well, yeah, I think it's, you know, when I was going to Iraq, I mean, this is just an example, I secretly said goodbye to everybody in my mind. I kissed my family goodbye because I didn't know. Yeah where I'm going or how I'm going to come back. But my Iraq story, but um, you feel that your fears are minuscule compared to what can come, on the, come out on the other side of it. And in 2009, when I decided to make this film, when I decided to go to Iraq, I had no idea that in 2016, the head of BBC World was going to approach me and say, can you make the story with us? Mm -hmm. You know, so I really just followed my intuition and I realized there is there is a story or there is an event or there is a reason bigger than my fears that pushes me to face my fears. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a challenge for myself, but it's also something that's bigger than me. And I think that as humans, we always need that something that's bigger than me. Religion, bosses, work, projects, money, whatever it is. Sometimes you, you, you use that to force you to challenge yourself and understand yourself. And I guess in a way, film does that for me. Mm. You're doing what you love. One of the things I love, yeah. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Have you just fall into it? How did you get into it? I mean, you, you write, you produce, you direct, you act. Did it just fall into place for you? No, never. It was never, it was never. First of all, the first biggest barrier I had was my own family. Okay who were like, what? You are equipped to be a lawyer, a doctor, a, you know. Well, not a doctor, but they, they always said you should be a psychologist or a you lawyer. You might be Australian, but you're still Persian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so the first thing that I did as a kid was what was available to me was a pen and paper. So I started writing. How old were you? Eight. You started seven. writing at eight? Yeah. I started, I have poems that I used to write when I was like eight. Maybe it's this like, oh, I can't be an actress. My parents won't let me. And I don't know. But uh, so I started writing stories and poems. And then the next thing that was available to me, which I could actually was tangible, was the theater. Yeah. So then I started to act. Get inspired. Whether you're in Dubai for business or pleasure, the last thing you want to do is blow your budget on accommodation which is why I recommend you check out our host venue partners, Rove Hotels. Beyond being price sensitive, 
What I love about Rove Hotels is the fact that they are a combination of cafe, culture, and just coolness. Even my guests, many of them, when they arrive before we record or after we finish recording the podcast, they actually comment. They go, wow, this place is cool. The vibe is amazing. And it is amazing. So if you're in Dubai for business or pleasure, I recommend you check out our host venue partners, Rove Hotels. This episode is brought to you by M Dojo. Whether you're in business or new to business, you need three things. A good website, traffic, and being able to convert that traffic into paying customers. That's what M Dojo does best. They're able to create for you a functional state-of-the-art website, drive targeted traffic, and put in all the elements needed in order to convert that into paying customers. Isn't that what you want? Of course it is. Give the team at M Dojo a call and see how they can help you increase your sales and profits. Tell them I sent you. Their website, mdojo.co. So I would write and act in, in, in theater when I could, whether it was school or outside of school. And then I continued uh, acting and um, theater and writing and you know doing everything drama until I was about 15 or 16. But you're so young, you have the sense already of what you want to do? I knew exactly what I wanted, yeah. Was I there knew... something that influenced you, that got you? Nothing. I don't think there was anything that influenced or got me. I mean, my mum used to play the movie Thriller a lot, which is Michael Jackson. Okay. When she wanted me to sit in one place, she would play that so that I don't move. Pay so attention for the next 20 minutes. I was too scared to move. Um, no, I can't really say that there was anything besides the love of, of stories that really made me go into um, wanting to tell a story as a storyteller and earlier on in my life as an actress. At a stage in your life, you were reading six or seven books a week. Yeah, that stage kind of, well, okay, so that was, I read Lord of the Rings at the school library when I was, I think, a or eleven, okay, and some of Harry Potter, not all of it. So I would just read and read and read. So I would go to the library, borrow seven books, read them over a week or two, and then go back give those seven because you were only allowed to borrow seven at a time. <laughs> so that's the whole reason you were limited to seven. I was limited I would to have seven. Taken more if I could. Oh yeah, I just loved going to you know I I, I mean apart from the documentary which was actually my first ever documentary, and I'm very grateful that the BBC took it up. Um, I'm a fiction fiction writer and fiction storyteller. I love science fiction and, and things that really go beyond, you know, and I guess in a way that's where the spirituality comes in for me as well because in my mind I can see things in a very different, different way and that's why science fiction as a tangible... Um, demonstration of that works. And were you influenced when, when you think of it as a as a but, creative person today by the books that you were reading at a young age? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I think it can go either way. It's kind of like there's a nature or nurture. For me, I remember one of the first books I ever bought was a UFO book. Okay. And this was, again, when I was quite young. And then the next book I bought was an astrology book. Again, probably under 10. So, you know, I was going that you way. You had that, that natural direction, gravitation. Yeah, towards mm -hmm. it. And then, and I guess the thing that really inspired me to make this documentary and what pushed me towards this genre, because this was not a genre that I really was felt that I was going to ever partake in or be a, be a uh, documentary filmmaker, um, was that this... One, this story was bigger than fiction. It was more fiction than fiction. Mm -hmm. No fiction story could have matched what I found. And I couldn't recreate it. I didn't want to recreate it. You know, it, those people deserved to sit in front of the camera and say what they wanted to say. Um, and that girl, should I go into this? Up to you. And, and the girl who, who dies, the protagonist in my film who dies, deserved to be seen. Mm -hmm. Maybe not in that light. I'm sure she was 
much more interesting person than the girl who was stoned to death. But she was deserved. You know, it was deserving. And honestly, um, to make a documentary, to, to make a film is difficult. Anyway, anyone who makes a film, even a flop, should really win an award because making a film from, from the time you have the idea or the script is given to you to the time that it's actually seen by an audience should just win an award for just finishing that film because it's very it's hard work it's, it's a lot to it I, I guess one of the things i'd really be interested in you do a lot of interviews um we'll put all the show notes you know to to the documentary and all the work that you're doing as well on the youtube channel and the podcast but what I want to do is I want to go through your thinking process, you know, how you think things through, your decision-making process, you know, what makes you tick. Um, I wish because, I knew. You know, I mean, honest answers like that. I mean, I, obviously, you know, at age you start going, okay, cool, I, I want to write, I want to write poems, this is what I want to do, and in a yeah. sense, find something that you gravitate to, and you're fortunate enough to be able to do it. Yeah. Um, so I guess- Has it been an easy, easy road? No. So I guess if you if, to go back to that story, then then from from theatre, uh, I had my first directorial experience at seventeen. So when I was seventeen, I got to direct a Shakespeare uh, play or part of, and that was the first time I felt that I really gave birth to something. It was immaculate. It was it was the most horrifying and blissful experience. Why horrifying? Because once the lights go up that you have no control anymore okay. in the theater play yeah. as the director you know it's 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 there everything you've it's done showtime. comes oh. up to this moment and from this moment onwards you're dead that death of the artist death of the author if you like so then it has a life of its own even though you are the owner of it mm -hmm. even though you are the creator of it i guess not only but the creator of it um so then from that I always thought that I would be in films, but as an actress. And when I realized that I really loved writing and directing and creating these worlds and drawing the audiences in, as not, shouldn't say just an actress, but not a part of the story, but as someone who can really put the story together, mm -hmm. again, goes back to my love for stories from a young age. Um, and you know, a lot of girls, a lot of kids play Barbies, but for me, those Barbies were a set. <laughs> and those were stories and that I was playing. creating. Yeah. And even if, you know, I, my parents always used to say, you were the, the best kid because you'd sit in a corner and entertain yourself. You know, they'd give me a piece of string or two pieces of string and I'd pretend they're people talking to each other. Or, you know, so for me, when I go back to the Barbie playing and why I loved it till I was like 11 or 12, and that's way past beyond the kids girls aged. They weren't just Barbie dolls. It was a set, it was a play or a movie. Mm. Um, do you remember your first story? The one, do you remember the first story you created or what story do you remember? That's a if very you good question. One? No one has ever asked me that question because I've never thought about it. The first story I ever created that I remember was a joke. <laughs> but I don't remember the joke. I just remember my dad was shaving before going to work and I was like, hey dad, I have a joke. And then, you know, he was like, oh, 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 oh. he was probably yeah. like, yeah, yeah, oh, oh, oh. you know, but I, it was, it would have been a joke. Yeah. Because I always felt as well that I should make everybody happy, that I should make my family laugh. Get inspired. One of the questions that I get frequently asked is, Kev, how can I increase my motivation? We see great individuals, we see achievers, like many of the guests that I'm bringing on the show. They have the energy, they do so much, they're in a state of flow. How do they do it? Well, my team and I have released an article which I've made available on kevinabdurrahman.org forward slash blog, the ultimate biohacking guide to increasing motivation. Or you can simply Google Kevin increase motivation and the article should pop up right at the top. It's absolutely free. Read it, and most important of all, take the bits and pieces that are relevant to you and apply it into your life to increase your motivation. I hope you find the article of value. If you do, feel free to leave your comments and also share it with your circle of friends. Again, you can Google it, Kevin Increase Motivation. It will be the first link that pops up or on my website, kevinabdurrahman.org forward slash blog. The first story that I...
I might remember the first poem, but I don't remember the first story, but that's a really good one. I should probably go back. What was the first poem? Or what was it about? It was about luck, uh, good luck and bad luck, and how bad luck can easily be blown away by the wind, just as good luck can easily be brought into your life by the wind. This is you Pretty writing. Deep. Yeah, this oh, is you writing. At yeah, eight. I remember exactly because we had a computer, one of those big, um, you know, those Microsoft big computers. Yeah. And I remember typing it up because I was like, this has to last, this pencil, you know, and this paper. So I typed it up. <laughs> and that's why I remember it. Good job, at eight. I definitely don't know what I was doing at eight. That's amazing. Um, fly on the wall. Ah. <laughs> Okay. What does it mean to you and what have you done? And the reason I ask for it, because if people don't know you, and I, I'm hoping that aspiring artists, performers, writers, creatives, you know, directors, producers, whoever they may be, uh, could perhaps look at you as an inspiration or if they'd like to follow footsteps or perhaps hearing your story, be courageous enough to go and look their story. And for them to realize that it's not just all handed to you. Let's say, okay, at eight, you found your thing of wanting to write. You're doing, you have that opportunity to write poems. You're creating stories and that's really you gravitating naturally to what you love yeah. to do. But I want to emphasize that aspect that it hasn't been handed to you. So tell us about the fly on the wall experience. Okay. So, uh, there came a point in my life where I realized that my love for um, telling stories and creating stories and creating these worlds that I could really study the human condition and explore um, situations from a perspective that was really uh, visual and oral obviously and make people think was beyond something I could do as an actress um, not beyond but acting was part of the story I realized for me I still love it but it's just you know, the other side has taken over so much that I don't have time even. So anyway, so then came the time that I wanted to transition from being someone in front of the camera to someone behind the camera mm -hmm. to tell these stories. And so I was still writing, directing and acting in theatre and short films. But I realised that to gain something, I had to give something up. And what I had to give up was the big auditions for big acting roles. To gain because something, I have to give something up. You were conscious of this or now that you look back? Mm, I wasn't conscious necessarily, but it was something that I did. It's like a survival instinct. It's you kind of had clarity. If I want this, I won't be able to do this. Yeah, but it, I didn't consciously say to myself, I'm going to give up these big acting roles so that I can go and be an extra. How did it happen? So I said to my agent, who was a great agent, I forgot what they were called, but I said to her that, um, can you get me on as an extra on as many shoots as possible? And she said, extra. She said, is that because you're, you're short of money? You need more money? Or what? I said, no, it's not just money. Because at the time you're studying, so you do want to make money but I said no I just want to get on, on the big, bigger sets without having to go through this auditioning process which is going to maybe take months or weeks I just want to get on there and I just want to watch and I just want to see how things are done bear in mind I had no one in my family who did this I, I don't so no contacts no contacts no friends in the industry no one so I had to find the fastest way to experience it. It wasn't even to go and get seen. You know, a lot of people go as extras or as actresses or actors or whatever to get seen. Yeah. It was more to see. So that's where the idea of the fly on the wall comes. So I, I would be writing and directing theater and studying at uni and, and working my part-time job at a fitness club or whatever. But at the same time, I would then get hired to go on these big sets, eat great food, because they always had these massive buffets. <laughs> <laughs> they always had Perhaps of the gel. Yeah, yeah, every time I came back, the agent was like, so how was that shit? I was like, breakfast was amazing. <laughs> and, you know, just sit there and watch. Watch and learn. Talk to everybody. You know, and I was that extra who was probably just friends with the whole crew. 
you know, the, probably the only people I didn't get to talk to were the producer and the director because they were, you know. But I would go and I would ask questions and I would say, what's this camera and how, how do you do this? And I would watch the lighting guys and I would watch the actors and I would watch the whole, you know, the way that the director would, you know, so I would watch. Directing came very naturally to me because I was always telling stories. But you making that decision to be an extra? Yeah, it was this, weird for everybody. Well, okay, I'm just going to... People didn't understand it. They're like, why are you going backwards? Yeah. Why? I remember people even on doing? set, they were like, oh, so you direct full-time and you're an extra part-time? And I was like, exactly. Because I was hungry. I was so hungry. It was a decision based on, I need, I want to learn this. Yeah, but you know, it wasn't, I wasn't like ABC. It was kind of like, I'm hungry, I'm going to go to the fridge and find something to eat. Simple Soon. as that. So I was hungry. I wanted to learn. I wanted to see. I wanted to experience. And I realized um, my fight in that sense was not the acting fight. Mm -hmm. It was not to be the next best lead actress or something. Although that is still a possibility. You never know. That's true. But it was really to be able to understand this world, the mechanics of how a, a, a real film crew worked. To me, like a clockwork. It was beautiful. Everybody knew what they were doing at the right time. It was just, I felt like I was in heaven. The first time I walked onto a film set, I felt like I, I was on heaven, in heaven. So this is it. This is what's been missing in my life. This is, this is it. And so I went from, you know, these big massive productions for your know, big brands as as commercials or I would uh, act in films, feature films or um, series where I was an ongoing extra so I, you know, um, to then finally doing a course at a place called Australia Film Base and then I was offered a job after I finished my course there to teach filmmaking. So I made my first film there and it won a lot of awards. Your first film? My first film, yeah. And that, that's why when I, when I went on to set and I was directing and I was, so I had written, produced, directed and was the lead actress of this film. And ta-da! All yeah. done by Pega. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. And it was kind of part edited by me as well. That's where I learned how to edit the film as well. Um, but then, uh, the owner or, or the tutor or whatever, he, he offered me a job there to help other students. And that was a really pivotal point for me because I realized um, without being conscious of this, again, none of this was conscious, but it kind of just led from one thing to another. Mm. I, was, I was unemployed for a while before that and I was just depressed and not knowing which way to go because the thing is I finished university I still didn't know anyone really in the industry and I went on a six-month trip and came back and everybody had already you know got their full-time jobs and all of this and so I made the decision let me go and try this and I had been collecting the brochures for a while and one day I just said let me go and try this and that's when I realized all of my thoughts, writings, and, and you know, I was working a, a job, actually, I, I got a job around at the same time, and I wrote the whole script at the job, and I cast all the actors from the job as well. So everyone, pretty much 90% of the, 99%, 98% of the actress, actresses and actors were from my work. And it happened to be a great film, and um, for the time... It seems like... You have it, whether you realize it or not, you're, you're resourceful with what you have. You make yeah. the most of what you can. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, and I, I guess I realized that I was like that from a young age as well. From um, learning if you're how casting to recycle. 98% of the people, hey, where's the closest surrounding? My work, here you go. Yeah. I'm just gonna cast these guys who are around me. And naturally, I see people as characters as mm -hmm. well. You know, like I look at you and I think, wow, he could be a mad scientist in a film. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I Best backhanded compliment I got today. <laughs> I'm sorry, most people would take that as a real compliment. You <laughs> said that to me too. Um, so, then, uh, so then I was teaching filmmaking. And so that's the fly in the wall story. 
And then I was kind of, you know, uh, helping other filmmakers realize their dreams, whether they were 60 or 10, 10, like 15, 20, you know. And we were making about probably 20, 25 short films a year, apart from other things. So what I would do then to, to, to this person, his name is Colin, Irish person, he realized that I have this hunger and I was just, basically I was glued to this man. I was like, okay, what are you doing next? Is I'm shooting a documentary. I'll be your gaffer, I'll be your camera guy, I'll be the whoever you want. We would go and anything that he did, I was his right hand for everything. Whether it was assistant, whether it was camera, whether it was lighting, whether it was acting, whether it was anything that I could be on a film set, I would be. And I guess my first behind the camera job. It sounds like you didn't give him an option. I think he really loved it and he told me that I've been doing this for about 25 years and you are the best student I've ever had. Your enthusiasm? My talent, <laughs> according to him. Yeah. My, my, he said, you're, you're a filmmaker. Yes. When you came to this class, I didn't know that at the time. But I, I think your that. hunger is that foot in the door for them to realize your skill. Yeah. From what it seems like. Possibly, yeah. And it's really because, you know, when, when you make a film, it's not like you're writing a story or you're writing a, a song. You really need other people to come with you on this journey. And the people who do it, I think, successfully, and whenever I've done it successfully, I've done it because there was nothing but the passion inside for what I wanted to create. It wasn't ever money, recognition, or for any other reason to prove myself to anybody else. It was really the hunger to tell this story and full blown passion. There was no, and I have failed. I have failed. I failed the times that I forgot that the only thing that really drives me as a person, people are different, is passion and hunger. And really to move forward with my heart. When I don't move forward with my heart, I fail. And it's, I've, I've experienced it a lot. Could you give us an example of a time where you didn't follow your hunger, passion? Okay, so heart? when you do your passion as a full-time job, there are jobs that you take on or projects that you take on that you may not be 100% passionate about. Right. And this is this is where you've got to realize where that might be. You know, people always say, oh, I'm making this film, but my passion project is. Whereas for me, it was always the passion project was the project. Mm -hmm. And at a young age... An interesting distinction. Yeah. And because and you I, hear this a lot. What you just said, you hear it a lot. That's right. Yeah. The, 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 your, my passion project. What I'm working on is this, but my passion project, the one I work on from midnight to morning is, you know, and I really wanted to flip that. And I made the decision that I'm not going to make money unless I'm going to make money doing this. So, Pega, you have a choice. Are you going to be that beggar on the streets or are you going to be using your talents to earn money? Because that's what I can give back to the world. That's what I can give back to the society and people. And in turn, gives back to me. You know, so when there were times that I took on a project purely, not purely, but I would say, you know, you can find passion in everything. For example, I... As I was saying earlier, I launched um, a steel company and I had so much passion for this steel company and I had so much passion for that story. I didn't care about the profit or the money that we made afterward or that it attached itself to Superman, Man of Steel. And the whole thing I created was in the cinema before that film, the whole time that film was running. You know, I never foresaw any of this. I just had this passion to create the story or for a satellite company, which was called VR Live, which I created as really amazing science fiction. I like to say amazing because it's a human story, but it's told through a science fiction. So then I was so passionate about that, that even my eye twitched and I had a red eye for a while because I wasn't sleeping because, you know, and then there were times when, you know, for the sake of the business, because I am a business owner and I do have people who rely on me for the sake of the business, I would take on a project that really I wasn't necessarily crazy passionate about and I hadn't done my homework. See, because when you want to create something, what we call is pre-production, which is sort of the planning, the business plan, if you will, um, 
you need to decide at that point, are you the best person for this or not? And you need to be honestly mature enough to say, you know what? Abdul Rahman over there is going to do this better than me because he's passionate about this. I'm going to produce it, he can direct it. Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to write it and he can produce it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, or, or, or just be in a place where you can, because to me, I think you can fall in love with anybody, you can fall in love with any story, you can create any passion, right? It's kind of like habits and discipline. Mm -hmm. If you discipline yourself for a month, it becomes a habit and yes. then it's your passion, right? So, but when you don't give yourself that time and when you're anything you run after runs away so if you're running for money whether it's to support the crew whether it's to support whatever for me and i knew this as a child and i know this now that it is your one-way ticket to failure it requires a level of maturity to be able to say i'm gonna because we live in a world where everyone wants to say i can do it i can do it i can do it yeah i can do it right because that's how we show off and that's our ego. But it requires a level of maturity to be able to say, hey, I'll just use my example. I'm a public speaking coach to CEOs and world leaders. And this very, very thin thing, if you had to pick it from a very thick layer of the things that you can do, is what I like to do and what I'm damn good at. Now, if there's anything in the scope, the chances are I can be okay at it, but it's not my line of work. And it requires a level of maturity to be able to go, here you go, I'm not fit for this, you need to find someone else, or let me suggest to you, Hega, who's great at this, and I recommend she does it. Yeah. That's not an easy thing and, to do. And you can always, the thing is, it's, it's kind of part of delegation as well, because you can always delegate. Mm -hmm. Like for example, um, again, I use, I, I use what I do as an example, Filmmaking is a world of delegations. Mm -hmm. You have to give people the space, time, and respect to do what they do best. And I've always been like this. And as I said, the lesson I learned is the one time I wasn't like this is when I failed. Because mm -hmm. I don't look back at my career and say I'm a failure. Even though I may have... I, I may have um, Wrong turns. Well, I may have had better turns mm -hmm. if I wanted to reach the goal that I want to reach for example, now, but at that time I made the best decisions. When the one time I can say is that I failed is when my head was in the wrong place, my heart was in the wrong place, mm -hmm. you know. And you always find that the people that are the most successful are the ones, in my opinion, that give people the value and respect that they deserve. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So it's not about them, it's about. Absolutely. Because you need to get the best of people. Perhaps. So yes. if I'm working with my camera guy, if I'm constantly changing his, his lens, or I'm, you know, I'm, I tell him what I want. It is his job to give that to me. He needs to find a way. So his passion needs to match my level of passion. If it doesn't, I'm the wrong person for him, and he's the wrong person yes. for me. he or she. Um, but you, what you said is great. It's then allowing... In this, in this example, allowing the camera person to then go and do what they need to do to help you achieve that outcome. That's it. Yeah. And as a director, you are really a manager of talent because you have a lot of talent around you and you really need to, you know, there's an ocean of talent and you, you really need to create this river uh, into this other ocean from one ocean to another ocean. So you really need to manage these talents and you really need to get them in line with your vision. So you need to be clear about that vision. And that's another reason why people fail is because they lose that vision. Money gets in the way, fame gets in the way. Things based on, I need to prove to other people, my classmates, my work colleagues, I need to prove myself. You know, all of these things get in the way and you end up making the decisions for the wrong reasons. And then you fall down. Since you mentioned vision, how do you communicate your vision to others? Okay, I can't draw to save my life. So we have, you know, storyboards. Yeah, all of my drawings are stick figures and half the time no one can tell what they are unless I'm there explaining it. But uh, usually I explain it by telling them. I show them examples. I have a storyboard artist, two or three that are really great and I work with them. So it's kind of like writing a storybook. So, so they draw it, I say it, and then we kind of look at the angle and we, you know, and then I present it to everyone else. But usually it comes from me telling a story. 
What's a misconception people have of your industry? Or of that the it's fun. World? Is it not? <laughs> It seems like every it's fun. single person that's like, oh, you're a filmmaker. Oh, oh it must that's be so fun. fun. Yeah. It's really hard. It's a hard job. It's not always What's hard? Fun. I mean, some people call like a, I have to start at 10, 10 a.m. and finish at 4, and it's hectic six hours. I mean, like well, that's a physical or... hard. So with filmmaking, you have the physical hard, and then you have the mental and emotional hard, and then you just, question everything spiritually and existentially because of that, <laughs> you know? So, for example, um, I was shooting a series and it was based around kids surviving in the middle of um, the wilderness. And so, story-wise, it was difficult. Mm -hmm. Physically, it was difficult. We had to camp and work with them. Working with kids was difficult. Um, it is not an easy job. It is not always fun. The only fun that you have, honestly, for me, is when I'm coming up with the story mm -hmm. and when it's done and, and I see that, you know, when people give you a round of applause or whether you, that round of applause is not just because, oh, they love my work. I'm so good. It just means they got you. Yeah. They got your message. They feel what you felt. Mm -hmm. And you've been successful as a director or as a producer to relay that message. As yeah. a creator of the idea. Yeah. So the last time my film was screened, the whole cinema gave me a standing ovation. And I was like, you know, at that moment, I was like, they got it. They got it. You know? And that's, the, that's what feels good. I thought what you do is fun. But when you break it down to all the different parts, and there are many more that you perhaps haven't shared, and it's all difficult or it's all challenging. Why do you do it? Yeah, why do you do it? Like, <laughs> my, I'm very clear about not liking to work so much with people, so I don't. And I've built my business around minimum contacts. With other humans. With other humans. Um. Because I'm just assuming that a lot of people will have things that they would love to do, Perhaps people watching this or listening to it on the podcast, and like, I want to be a filmmaker too. Yeah, I love filmmaking. Yeah, I'm a creative. I want to do it. Well, and I then think... you start going through all these. Yeah. Realizing every single point of contact is difficult. I guess you go back to the old saying, you know, you. You love, you know, it's really the love and the passion that, that drives you because. Of that finished me, product. Well, I always go back to the seed. When I get lost like this and I get tired, physically, mentally, emotionally drained and tired, I go back to the seed and I say, okay, why did I plant this seed? Nice one, okay. And so when I go back to the seed and I realize from the time I planted the, this seed, I'm now a flower, a tree, a small tree. I don't want to call myself a big tree yet. This seed is your childhood or this seed is the beginning of a project? This seed is the beginning of why I love storytelling. What makes me do what I do today. What makes me go through all, everything that you're saying. Nice analogy. And I, I have to deal with, can I swear? Sure. I have to deal with really <coughs> shitty clients. Yeah. Shitty crew, <coughs> shitty cast, <coughs> shitty people. And you know, there's something about shoes. It's, just, yeah. it's very shitty, yeah. you know. No, saying it just, it's a good yeah. release. Say, yeah. say whatever you want. <laughs> sometimes you, you really go through the grind and then someone, no one appreciates what you do. Or someone doesn't appreciate it. The person who's supposed to, you know. Um, but going back to your question. So your seed, you do the seed, this is the self-talk you're conscious of? When you're down on energy or you're frustrated? Yeah. Yeah, because it happens a lot in my field, in what I do. Because, see, you say that I work with people a lot. The truth is 90% of the time I'm on my own. Mm -hmm. So whether it's ideation or post-production, so before and after the shoot, I'm on my own. Okay. It's only those one week, two weeks, whatever the time, one day the shoot is, that I'm actually surrounded by people. Mm -hmm. Generally, I'm on my own. Okay. So there does come a time where, for example, when when you were telling a heartbreaking story. Mm -hmm. Why am I watching all this death 
I'm killing. And, you know, and then you go back to the seed, whether it's the seed of why you started that project or why you started this. Because as I said, you get so tired that you start existentially questioning everything yeah. you're doing. Why am I here? And the you reminder know? is that storytelling is important for you, or It's important for me and it's my way of really, you know, I have something in here and this world in here and I really want to share it and I really want to help others mm -hmm. with it. And film gives me, you know, as another metaphor, you know, the projector. The, the, so it's kind of like I am the projector of, of that. You know, touching people emotionally and making them think, you know, is this wrong? Why am I like this? If it's wrong, then why do I do this? You know, socially also helping people on a deeper level. Um, your, uh, your creative company that you founded? Yeah. It's self-titled. Yes. <laughs> But of course, it's going to be self-titled. Pega! <laughs> Why did you call it Pega? And what's your subtitle or motto, so tagline. to speak, behind it, the tagline? So when I decided to self-title my company, I looked at many, many names. And no matter what I looked at, it represented a part of me. Now you know, you know, there's this there's all these different elements to my what I do. And I really wanted to title it a name that reflects me. Okay. And that people know who they're talking to. Because, you know, in, in, in the world we live in today, okay, I could have called it Twilight Films. My name literally means the light of twilight, you know. So, I could have called it, you know, anything, but at the end of the day, I really, I guess, I really just wanted to do something that I can, one, stick with. Two, that people know who they're, who they're talking to, whether they're clients or audiences or who it is behind this. Um, and also because I'm also, you know, I'm not just a creative production company, I will also work with other creative production companies, mm -hmm. you know. The tagline is, let me tell you a story. That's awesome. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> and the and reason, so true to you. Yeah. And so when you see Pega, let me tell you a story, you know exactly what, who you're dealing with and you know exactly what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that story time is, has always been the best time for anybody. Um, yeah, the most fun time, whether you're a kid or an adult. And we, we, we live on stories. We base a lot of things on stories. Mm -hmm. Our thoughts and our opinions are based on stories. Um, just to touch on with public speaking coaching, the, the single critical thing or skill that I'm working with with a CEO or world leader, because they're great at what they do, is storytelling. Like, what's your message? How can we say it? in a format that everyone will love, whether you speak to a 60-year-old or a 60-year-old. Storytelling. Yeah. And I think also I was really pushed out by the people around me because they said, look, why are you not letting people know you? Why are you, you know, why have you lived in Dubai, for example, for 10 years? And there's only specific, and it is all those really high-profile people that I do know, mm -hmm. but they were like, why don't other people know you? And I guess I had my head down and I was doing my work. Busy working, doing. Doing. And, you know, it was really that, for example, when I, when I had to do that, that talk and that you helped me with, um, it was really hard for me to get up and talk about myself for an hour. When I finally reached into myself and I said, okay, what is this that I can bring out and share this authentic story came out, and that's what people want to know. And that's what's interesting, and that's what I have to share. So I didn't have to get up there and be someone else. I didn't have to hide. Because the thing was, as you remember, I kept trying to shift the attention to this film, or that film, or this person, or that person. I did a whole TV interview, and honestly, half of it, I talked about my brother-in-law and my sister. I remember you said that. <laughs> because I just wanted to shift, shift, shift the attention. Um, and in today's world, nobody does that, but I have a 
real problem that I have childhood trauma that I have to deal with, I guess. I don't know. But You're getting better. Yeah. Uh, since, since, since we brought up your you know, creative production company, creativity seems to come natural to you. Does it? Yes. If someone watching this is not a creative, say someone like me, I don't consider myself to be a creative. Um, but I know that in today's world, when you look at it, the reality of it, creativity is an important skill. So whether you're creative or not, it's a skill that would be extremely helpful for you in life. What would be some suggestions for you or how do you get the most out of yourself in terms of creativity? Or if that doesn't apply to someone that's watching or listening, if someone, let's say like me, I'm not creative. Here's the question. I'm not a creative person. Help me become more creative. So if you look at creativity and what it really means, and as you we were talking, this is actually the first time I've really thought about this. It really means a way of solving a problem that then something that's it's different to what you would think is logical. Mm -hmm. That's a good way of putting it. So, but it's actually really logical. So, for example, just if, hasn't been done before, maybe. Yeah. So, for example, when I'm playing backgammon, so I love playing backgammon. Very I'm, Persian. Very Persian. But there, you know, there are certain things that you know. You get uh, six and three. You know exactly what you're going to move. You get two and five. You know what you're going to do. You get double six. You know it. But. The creativity comes in is when you get a number and you could do that move, but there is actually another move that will take you closer to that, to your goal of, you know, um, that's when you realize, okay, I, I did something creative. And, and I mean, doctors are creative okay. because they diagnose you and that's why doctors all have different opinions. And nobody thinks about this. I would have never thought doctors are creative. But a doctor has to be creative in treating you because there are multiple ways of treating something. Mm -hmm. And again, it comes back to the C, why are you a doctor? Do you want to make money or do you really want to help people? Mm -hmm. Is how you treat people. You know, I've been to doctors that said, you know what, go home and uh, just put some lemon in hot water and drink that for a week and you'll be fine. Then I've had doctors who've given me 25 different tablets to have. Because all they care about is writing out That's prescriptions. Right. So, you know, um, scientists are creative. I mean, mm -hmm. look at AI. Look at technology. Without technology, how could I be doing what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. So really, the technology gives me the ability to tell a story in a certain way. Who knew? You know, I mean, why? If you think back to before animation or puppetry, can do donkeys talk? Mm -hmm. Donkeys can't talk. Someone one day decided donkeys will talk. Yeah. And so the first one was a drawing or a puppet. And then, you know, so creativity, I guess, as well as solving a problem, is really being uninhibited in the way that you're thinking. But what you're saying requires a level of awareness, right? Yeah. To be aware that you are now perhaps being creative. But what if I say I am not creative? Help me become creative. What steps can I take? to learn the skill of creativity, to become more creative, to practice creativity, so I can, like a muscle, I guess, right? Build yeah. that muscle. From a creative person, what would be your suggestion? I guess anything takes practice, so it depends on what you want to be creative in. Mm -hmm. As I said, anybody's creative. You are a creative, by the way, because you, when you were coaching me, you used a lot of creativity to help me. Okay. You don't know that, but I know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Um, it's interesting, so perhaps, then based on what you said, we all are creative if we're doing something that's in line with our scene. I think mothers are creative. They have to be. You know, I mean, there you have to be creative. I just see my sister-in-law dealing with my two nephews. I'm like, oh wow, she's having a lot of creativity on the minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think creativity isn't just, oh wow, Steven Spielberg is creative person. He is a creative person, but he's also, you know, he's very good again at running this machine of people that I mentioned before, you know, so 
everybody can be creative. I think if you just need to say, okay, what do I want to do? If you're already thinking, how do I become more creative? Then you're already halfway there because you're already practicing, because you're already thinking outside of the box and you're already thinking, I need to think outside of this box. So what you're really saying is, how do I become an uninhibited thinker? Mm -hmm. How do I become a person who thinks outside of the box? Mm -hmm. Then you watch and you learn and you practice and you read and you, you really want to extend your capacity. I think some of us are born with it, just mm -hmm. like musical talent. Sure. Uh, I learned to play the piano. I went and learned how to play the piano. But my brother came out, who'd never been to one piano class, and he was like, da -da 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 -da. and I was like, okay, how did this happen? When did this happen? You know, and now he's an amazing musician as well as an artist. So I think, you know, Passion. I don't know if I'm answering what you're saying because I don't think there's a rule of thumb. But I think what you said is interesting is perhaps being self-aware or the desire to want to be more creative yeah. is the first step to then ask the question, okay, what do I need to do? How am I doing this? How else can I do this? Oh, that's a good one. So, for example, when I look at a situation, and this is when I knew I, I had to move away or not move away, but you know, become a storyteller. Is I can see this from multiple angles. I don't have to move. I do it in my mind. I can see it from multiple angles. How am I seeing it now? How else can I see it? Well, that's really good. You know, I love this tip because it's easy to implement if someone chooses to do it. So if I'm serious about wanting to be creative, I can literally apply this into anything that I do and ask the question, okay, I'm writing a proposal. How am I doing it? How else can I do it? And it is interesting. Maybe I am slightly creative. You are creative. Yeah, maybe I am slightly creative. <laughs> I don't know if it's slightly, when, but I actually when, really creative. Yeah. When I put uh, when I just brought this proposal up, I made a change in the way I I would, you know, when the, when we got asked for proposals, I made a small change and I'm happy to share the tip. You can apply it if you like, or you will see the benefits. Most people when they want to set up proposal they'll just do it hey send us a proposal sure they'll type it out PDF it send it on email and I thought to myself my whole point of difference in terms of my, my work is me that's what I do and when a client already experiences it they know the difference and they never go anywhere else because they've experienced the difference but until then how do I stand out from paper because everyone's just going to receive more emails they're going to receive 10 proposals how do I stand out so I stopped giving out proposals when people ask for proposals. Instead, instead of typing it out, I would video it. And considering my line of work, which is public speaking coaching, I was doing two things at once. I was giving the client the experience and I was standing out from a dozen emails that they would have received as the only person who said, hey, Ahmed, thank you very much for your request. Da -da 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 -da. This is what I can do for you and this is how I can guarantee results. I'd love to have a chat. That's amazing. Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of, you know, when you said, how do you do it? How do you explain your vision? Sometimes, you know, I have to go through files and files and files and films and films and films and think of, you know, where did this vision come from? And is there any, sometimes no one else has made it mm -hmm. like that, but you kind of go, okay, imagine Jaws. Now imagine that shark is, you know, a light. You know, so you, you do have to draw on examples and stuff like that as well, but exactly what you said. Get inspired. Imagine if you could present yourself, your thoughts and your ideas with clarity and confidence. Imagine if you could speak to influence and impact. Imagine if you could communicate like a commanding and charismatic leader. Well, you can given the right information and the investment of effort from your end. How do I know that? As a public speaking coach, I work with CEOs, world leaders and presidents. And when they hire me, they expect nothing short of results. And over the years, it's been two decades now, two challenges have risen for me being unable to help the majority of people. I'm usually on a plane with the majority of my time being booked a good year or two in advance. And my one-on-one -on -one session to work with someone in person generally starts at $20,000. So we solved the problem. 
by making my public speaking course available for you online. Everything that I teach my clients when I'm working one-on-one. -on -one. Thoughts, tips, strategies, how to do things, all on video, all sequenced in the right order for you to be able to watch, re-watch, practice, and refine your presentation, your speaking, and your overall communication skills. And guess what? You will get results. Now, you can have this course, not for the $20,000 that my clients pay me when we work one-on-one. -on -one. You can have it for $9.97. That's right, just $9.97. You might be thinking, well, why are you offering something that you charge $20,000 for, for $9.97? It's simple because those who want to work with me one-on-one -on -one will still hire me. But for many whom I might be out of their budget, this is a great way to develop their communication skills, to cut through the noise, to rise above the rest, and to beat their competition. If you're serious about wanting to develop your skills, to be able to present your thoughts, your ideas, and yourself with clarity and confidence, to be able to speak, to influence and impact, and to communicate like a confident and charismatic leader, then this course is for you. Go on to kevinabdurrahman.org forward slash course and get started today. So what you do is you had a goal and you thought of different ways and that you chose the best way to implement that goal. That's why I said it's, it's about solutions. People don't think of creativity as solutions. Yes. People think of creativity as la di da she sits there and stares at the sky and writes. Whereas you know, an like, actual fact, you can be conscious of There is a science. Yeah. There, is a science behind, there is a science behind storytelling. There is a science behind film. There's a science behind acting. There's a science behind everything. There is a science. There are formulas, whether you're conscious of them or not. For example, you as an audience, you're not a filmmaker. When you watch a horror film, Take those sounds from the horror film and put them on a comedy. Mm -hmm. They make the comedy funnier, but they make the horror more scary. Just the sounds. Interesting. Dum -dum, you know. Mm -hmm. In a comedy that makes you laugh, in a horror that because you without consciously knowing it, you know the difference. I'm a little bit like Alfred Hitchcock because he's a scary cat, well, he was a scary cat. I'm scared. I was scared to go and make the films that I made. I was scared of the things that I was writing sometimes. But that's what made me good at it because I know how my audience feel when they see it, when they feel it. Interesting. What would you say I guess I want, I want to talk about how you progressed because of what you just said. You were scared, but you still did it and you got better. How do you progress? How do you become better at writing, at conceptualizing your thoughts? <clears throat> how do you get better at writing? Keep writing. Don't stop writing. How do you get better at conceptualizing your thoughts? Keep conceptualizing your thoughts. How do you get better at, at Understanding a concept, explore, keep exploring the concept. How do you get better at creativity? Keep being creative. It's like riding a bike. Mm -hmm. It's like running. First day you run for five minutes, next day you run for seven, Yes. and so on. And then all of a sudden you're running for an hour and a half and you stop because you're bored, not because you're puffed out. But the key is that consistency. Consistency. You've got to keep going no matter what. No matter who stops you. People that know you associate the word crazy with you. Do they? <laughs> Could you perhaps tell us one of the crazies? Do they? Or, or do what they, they really? Well, they, what they think is, why would she do that? Why? Well, she's got so much going for her. Why would she make that move? Or why would she do this? Kind of like you were directing and you were in theater, or you know you were doing that, that aspect of it, and suddenly you go, hey, I want to be an extra on sets. Yeah. To you, it made sense, but people are going, she got mad? Yeah. That's what I meant. So, and a lot of my peers thought that. So, you know, I went to university with a lot of great filmmakers who today are really amazing at what they do. And they were like, what are you doing? Mm. That's what I mean. That's crazy. That's I mean, crazy. I was for example, one of, like, my, what are you doing? one of my best mates 
it, we went to the same class. He was directing McDonald's ads, and I was an extra on his ads. I didn't have I didn't have the people to help me get there. Okay. He did. Yeah. So I would not an extra. Sorry, I was a runner. So I was the guy or the girl who was like, hey, Pega, can you please go and get the actress Sudafed? Oh, Pega, you know, the light went down. Can you go, go up and fix the light? Oh, Pega, can you, you know. Oh, wow. So that I could really get my head around, you know. So I guess one of the other crazy steps that, that I took towards taking me closer to my passion or exploring my passion was that when I had everything going for me in Australia, great job, Good contacts. I'd worked so hard. Now I knew everybody, and people knew me. And was I made the decision to go to Iraq? So you start with nothing in terms of the industry, no contacts, no experience. You build all that up. <laughs> what is she doing? <laughs> exactly. So then I decided. You know what? I've had enough of this. I was hungry. See, the thing that people might not understand what makes you do crazy things. What makes a dog? A dog. It's, it's crazy dog, from it's, the out, from from the outside. From the outside, but to you, it to makes you sense. It, yeah. Why? Because you know, for example, you know you want to get from here to here. So, I made the decision to go to Iran. I couldn't read or write. I didn't know anyone in the industry there. Um, so willingly, I'm thinking, looking at you, you've gone from a place here to a new continent. A new country. And start here. And start at the bottom. Yeah. No language. Yeah. I, I could speak, but I mean, when you speak to your family, it's different to when you speak to people out in a professional world. Okay. No name in the industry. Yeah. Run us, okay, take us through your thoughts. <laughs> What's so I looked at the filmmakers. So I looked at everything that was available to me and other filmmakers in Australia, which was a lot. We had everything whether it was technologies, whether it was talent, whether it was the funding that was there. It's well. Australia, maybe, yeah. Get inspired. You know this by now, that we are the number one YouTube show slash podcast that's coming out of the Middle East from Dubai. If you like the idea of having your brand reach at least a million eyeballs per episode, then feel free to reach out to my office on kevinabdurrahman.org. Without further delay, Let's continue this great conversation. Although things can happen really slowly because there is, you know, you have to go through many layers of bureaucratic, you know, but... Well, the resources. The resources were there. And, and we having were making established films names. And, and having, yeah, the somewhat at the time, yeah, yeah. I decided I really wanted to explore a different kind of filmmaking, which was very raw and which is more focused on poetry, the poetry of story, which is the Iranian filmmakers for me. Because if I look at it, I look at the Italians, and I look at the Iranians, and I look at the French, and I thought, what's the most available to me? The Iranians, because I'm Iranian. So I went there. So I packed up. I lost a lot of friends in doing so. Um, I lost a lot of those fun times, those fun 20s in your 20s times that you have with your friends, I lost a lot of that. And again, it comes back to what are you gaining from what are you giving up? And I would never do it differently now. So I went to Iran and I figured, what do I do? How do I get in? What's the first thing, easiest thing that can get me in? It was acting. Um, and at the time, now we have a lot of female filmmakers and a lot of a lot of females behind the camera. But at the time, it was really difficult. Um, and I thought, okay, what's the first thing? And my mum happened, her my mother's childhood friend happened to be a television actor. Uh, her brother happened to be a television actor, and so she introduced me to him. Now, I was never into television, let alone television acting. Anyway. Your vision is to make movies, but you're thinking to yourself, sorry, how do, I get in? how do I get how in? How do I get in? How do I get in? How do I understand acting? this? Yeah, if it's acting, it's That's the same as the do. extra thing. If it's going to be a, being an extra, being a fly in the wall, I'm going to do it. So I went for the audition. Lo and behold, I got a lead role in this TV series. The director, I was so good at mimicking the accents. Now, when you speak Farsi, your jaw and tongue move in a completely different way to when you speak English properly without having an accent that is from Australia. 
So how did I practice? I started listening to Iranian songs and pronouncing them like with an open jaw so that this jaw can open up because when you speak English, you speak like this. Right. But I'm not, when the, you know, when, when, when people from South, uh, not South, when like Eastern Europe speak, they kind of speak like this, right? But when they speak English, they really have to like open up. So it's the same thing with Farsi. You really Next have to level. change the way that you, that this jaw moves, right? And they're very expressive. Iranians are really expressive. Like, ah, ah, you know, it's not like, ah, like, you know, it's just like, ah, ah. You know, where you're right, everything's yeah, right. massive, yeah. you know, everything's big. So anyway, I got this role and it was the only uh, woman in the whole series wearing a chador. I ne had never even worn one before, I didn't wow. know. Besides Discomfort. the one time that I had gone to a mosque. Discomfort at so many levels. Yeah, absolutely. And or, uh, in, completely out of your comfort zone. Completely out of Could my you comfort. read at that point? No. So he used to give me the script. Lead role, I couldn't read the yeah, script. Yeah, one of the lead roles. and. He would give me the script, and then I would go home. I and, remember this. <laughs> they didn't would, know you couldn't read. They couldn't read. No, no, I couldn't tell them that. That's no, what I remember. First of all, I didn't want them to know I'm from Australia. So somehow everyone on set started believing that I'm from the village because I had a weird accent and the way I behaved was different and I wouldn't really talk to people. I didn't want to give it away, so I wouldn't talk to people, you know. I, I, I would try to keep to myself so people wouldn't know that I'm not from there. Although a lot of people think, but that's a great thing. You grew up abroad and you came back with all this experience and you should have showed off with that or whatever. For me, it was a weakness at the time. Again, it's how you look at something. Mm -hmm. I felt that this, this, this thing I had were not my wings. It was my anchor. Okay. That I felt that um, I needed to find a way to fit in so that I can really just find my way through this maze rather than being treated as that girl who's a foreigner from overseas, who's grown up somewhere else. And does that make sense? Was it because you were wor worried that doors wouldn't open for you as much or they won't be as open to, I think to seeing for first you to of allow all, you to see things? Yeah, I think first of all, people wouldn't be authentic in their relationships with me, mm -hmm. in their friendships or the way they, they treated me. I really wanted to understand how Iranians in Iran, as well as learning you know, from the amazing filmmakers and experiencing that filmmaking style for myself, it was really to, to get into the culture without being an outsider. So because was, even though you're Iranian, but at that point in time, you were culturally an Aussie. Yeah, I, yeah, so absolutely. And that's what you had to, you were literally a foreigner going back, mm -hmm. having to learn the culture. And I felt like my parents, when my parents came to Australia, because they, they had probably the same issues I had when I went to Iran. And I understood them so much better after that. Because, you know, how do you cope with a society that thinks in a completely different way to you? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to reconfigure your brain in a way to try and fit in. So the acting, so I would take the script and I would sit there with an English to Persian and Persian to English, two dictionaries, and I would rewrite it all in what we call Fingilisi, which is Persian English. So writing Persian with English letters. Right and then reading it and then practicing it and then going back the next day and then acting it. So Salam would be S-A-L-A-M, so then you can just read it as Salam. Salam, yeah, yeah. So then um, eventually the director came up to me and he said, why don't you speak to anyone during between the takes? And I said, oh, because I'm focusing on my role. <laughs> and he said, and you know, Iranian women don't usually hold their chador like that. <laughs> <laughs> Snap. And so the thing was, because, I mean, you would hold it and then in between the takes, I would roll it up and hold it like this while I was waiting for the next, <laughs> you know, and he was like, no one does that. This is ghetto. You know, <laughs> no one does that. <clears throat> And eventually everybody found out that I was from Australia and so on. So that was my first uh, entrance. Well, and then I'm so intrigued at the fact that it would stop many people. <laughs> the fact that they couldn't read a script. Yeah. To be, you know, to be an actor or actress. Yeah. Like it's one of the leading roles. Yeah. That, 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 that doesn't seem to have even crossed your mind at that point. Like, no. Oh yeah. Because I had a goal. Mm. Because I had a goal. Can we because I, yeah, because I needed to make films in Iran. I had a goal. I needed to do it. It wasn't, nobody paid me to go and do this. Nobody said, gave commission to me for a job. Nobody, I needed to do it. So I guess I went from that 
to meeting somebody who I co-wrote uh, a script with. And then uh, we co-found a production company in Iran. And it's still going and it's successful. And it's, they're still making films there. But I'm no longer obviously there. I'm not really attached to it in any way. I think it's still called Pega New Wave Films or something. It was not my choice to call it Pega. It was my partner's choice at the time, my business partner. But um, then I, you know, found a group of people and who, you know, they could see and feel this passion. And they came with me and we went to the north of Iran, maybe a six or seven man crew. And we made the film that became the award-winning film that went to international film festivals and we made it with $3,000. And I remember being at the film festival in Abu Dhabi, actually, the Middle East Film Festival, and seeing these films who were made with like $50,000 or $30,000. And you did yours like th with three. And it was competing with them. And I, you know, I remember that moment of, this is real. Passion really is real. Passions become things. <laughs> yeah, they say thoughts become things. So. And I had the chance to, to meet a lot of um, really well-known and renowned filmmakers and partake in their, in their productions and learn from them. Um, but for me, it was really this hunger. And people were saying, why don't you go and be someone's so, um, assistant director? Why don't you go to... I didn't want to be anybody's assistant director. I didn't want to go and watch, you know, yes, maybe I would have learned a lot faster, but I really... I had this urge, I, this is the story I want to tell. How can anyone else tell this? You were clear about it, you had this clarity. Yes. And I think that's one of the most important things. You're right for it. For it. I, can see what, I can see your brain, I can see you thinking. Yeah. I can hear your brain ticking. That's the most important thing. Yeah, clarity. It if it's money, great. Whatever it is, as if long as you're clear about it. As long as you're clear about it. You're and as long as your, your, your intentions it might sound a bit pious or whatever, but as long as your intentions are authentic mm -hmm. and they're true to yourself and they're good. Then you go far. I mean, there are people who have been successful in creating atomic bombs, mm -hmm. but I'm sure that that genius that created that was not planning on killing a lot of people. Mm -hmm. That was someone else with another goal who took that. Mm -hmm. And you understand what yeah. I mean? So You know, the clarity thing just comes from I've been super conscious about it in the last few years and it's an aspect it's clear to me that at that point you had that clarity because I've been conscious of it for the last few years and I've come to realize that if we don't take the time and it's been, it was something that was uncomfortable for me to actually discuss with myself about what is it that you want Kev, let's say in my case, what do you want in your life because it's a difficult process because at the beginning it's I don't know man this is my own self-talk. I'm lost. I don't know what I want. I don't know what I want to do. I want this and I want that and I want that. And I want everything. So to actually have to attain clarity is quite uncomfortable because I have to ask the question, okay, what do you want? Because if you want something, that means you have to go down a specific lane, which means that you can't take the other lanes. And if you go down this lane, it means that you won't be able to do a few other things. And this lane is going to come at a cost and it will t probably take a lot longer than you want it to. Is this the lane you want to be in? Because at some point, maybe that lane is going to change. Will you be okay with that? And all that. It's a hard process. So when you ask me, why are you still doing this if yeah. you're making this so hard? I can ask you the same. Because I've seen you transition. Yeah. I remember catching up with you a few years ago. And you were, I said, what are you doing? You said, I don't know. I'm going through a season of my life where I'm just watching series. Yeah. That part hasn't changed very much. I'm enjoying it. Yeah, but you said, I'm not doing anything else until I know what I want to do. Yes. And look at you today. Yes. So, and it's not an easy road. What you're doing is not easy. Mm -hmm. Because you, like me, you are really, not to use the word selling ideas, but you are, you are giving people something that's not tangible. Mm -hmm. You cannot give them this product, but you can give them something that will change their lives. Mm -hmm. So, um, we come back to the point where in order for you to do that, you have to be willing to not do many other things. 
and be okay with that. Mm. You know, a lot of people say to me like, don't you want to get married and have kids? Don't you want to start a family? Of course I do. Why not? But is that what drives me right now? Or is that what drives me for the last 10 years or drove me for the last 10 years? Or will that drive the next 10 years of my life? Maybe. That's okay. Yeah. I've never sat there consciously writing my future. I've just followed the signs and followed my passion and followed my heart. Mm -hmm. And it brought me here. Now I'm at a stage where this is, now it's going to get me somewhere. Because I have spent the last 20 years doing this. Yes. Now is the time that I've got to go from A to Z. Maybe not Z, maybe J. Mm -hmm. But you know, now, now is the time where things need to really flip. In that sense. And that overnight success is 20 years. <laughs> just to just yeah. to really emphasize it because we... Yeah. Well, it's more than 20 years if you think about when I, when I was 9 yeah. or 8. We won't give away your age. It's okay. 20 plus. <laughs> no, it's just sometimes we need the reminder. We all just need the reminder of going, hey, this, this, this has been a lot of blood, sweat and tears. Absolutely. And it doesn't stop. That's the thing. I don't think, uh, I think Richard Branson is a great person to look at mm -hmm. because he always looks like he's having a great time. Yeah. Right? And you think, how is this guy always having a good time? And look at what he's created. He just does things that excite him. And like he, he can't allows excitement. people to grow. You know, I love, I love this. You know, he says, you give people enough skills for them to be able to walk away. Mm -hmm. They treat them so well that they want to stay. Okay. Yes, that is so good. You know, and this is the key because if you have the power, see, I always think a thought is a responsibility and a power is responsibility. If you have the power to change someone's life or allow them or help them become better, if they leave and they backstab you, which has happened to all of us, no problem. They have, that's their part. Mm -hmm doesn't take away from what you do. Absolutely. Right? As long as you don't, you know, my friend used to always say in Iran, actually, he used to say, you pick up the bread from your own sofa and you put it in someone else's plate. Why do you do that? And I used to do that. But I learned that, you know what? I can share it. Yes. But I have to keep some for myself. Sure. And the thing with people like that is they allow the people around them to grow. This guy doesn't want to be Richard Branson, yes. but he wants to be the best IT guy in Virgin that has ever existed. And mm -hmm. he will be because he's got, he's, he, he can grow if he wants to. Yes. And I love being around people like that, who want to grow, who match my passion, who don't, you know, who aren't there for just the sake of being there. And I realize that, you know, you're only as good as the people you have around you. You can be a genius, but if the people around you don't see your vision, especially again in my field, where you really need to build a team of people who share the same want of being the best at what they mm. do. How do you pick that circle? You well, obviously realize the importance of it. <clears throat> and I, I say protecting your mind. Yeah. And how do you get people on that level? So they're not taking it's you down, but they're taking you up. It's very, very hard because a lot of people in my industry are medically depressed. <laughs> <laughs> probably because well, of the long hours they have that's to work. For the books. <laughs> because of probably the, the amount of hours they have to work. And I mean, you know, you put your, your heart and passion, money, sweat, tears in something, and then it flops. And everybody's experienced that. I haven't yet. But, you know, everybody's experienced that. So basically, if, if you know... Is it then a circle that you create out of your field? I think it's a circle you create based on what you need at the time. Mm -hmm. So for example, the circle I create for making a science fiction film is going to be very different to the circle that I go to Iraq with to shoot a documentary. Sure. So it's not a circle, but it's many circles. It's finding the best people who fit the job and fit the vision and fit the role. So I guess in that sense, that is why I don't have, you know, I don't buy cameras or I don't buy equipment or I don't hire people on a full-time basis because I know there will come a time where this person or that equipment, that piece of equipment is going to be redundant. So your because model in terms of business is in essence project-based because this project requires yeah. 
this kind of a personality, yes. this kind of equipment, yes. these are the requirements, yes. and the next one could be completely different, yes. which makes all this redundant. Yes, because you know, I, I realized that as much as I tried to box myself in my life, because fitting in was a big thing for me, because I was always a, a, a kid who didn't fit in, because I didn't think the same as everybody around me. So I guess from being a kid, um, to, to, you know, having to think in a way that, that you can fit in or whatever, I finally accepted myself that I have many facets mm -hmm. and I'm able to do many things. I cannot hire someone that is the second pegger in all of the things I do because my assistant needs to be the second me. So I need to have a second me here, a second me there, a second me there, a second me there, and then a third me, and then a fourth me. Someone looking at this on YouTube or they're listening to it on podcast, they go, She's doing exactly what I want to do. But they're either at the beginning, they don't have the network, they don't have the experience. Let, let's just say your version of you when you started. Knowing what you know today, what would you tell them to take in terms of steps to be able to do what, you know, say, to be able to do what they'd like to do, I say, at your level today? From the experiences, say... wrong turns and so forth, what would you say would be the smartest moves? To take. Get out there as much as you can. Don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Don't don't be run by ego. Ask. And if you really are hungry, follow where that hunger leads you. That's a good one. Don't don't stop. Get out there. And whatever way you can. For me, I had to do a lot of different things, you know. Get out there the best way that you can. The, the ways that are available to you, I told you, I made an example that the first thing that was available to me was a pen and paper. So I used that, then it was the stage, so I used that. Then it was short films, so I used that. Then it was, you know, so whatever I was able to use, I did. And really just follow your passion because you don't know what, where the end is. I never thought in my wildest dreams, even up until the age of 19, that one day I would be actually directing because I didn't think that that's what I was born to do. But I followed my heart, I followed my passion, and then it took me here. The thing is, it's <clears throat> unfortunately because follow your passion is such an idyllic thing to, to say and do, and it's easy to, to do that. And people will go, okay, I'll just quit my job and follow my passion, or I wanna go and get a job, which is my passion, you know, whatever it is. But in the process, I've come to see a lot of homeless, passionate people sitting at cafes, going I'm nowhere, yes. <laughs> going I'm nowhere, done. all around the world. I've seen this in Bali. I've seen this in, um, you know, Amsterdam. I've seen this in Dubai. I've seen this yeah, in that's Utah. A, that's a very I've seen this point. in Sydney. Mm. There's a difference between you know, follow your passion, and just go, or, and actually you know the steps to take to yeah so really you have to think about you know the line that i guess i drew was am i going to be very very early on i said am i going to be that homeless passionate person or am i going to learn how to make money from this because we live in a world where you have to make money yeah if you're so, paying rent like the landlord won't understand you're a passionate creative exactly they Pay don't the care rent. about the story you're writing they don't care about who you know they don't even care about who you know you could be best friends with Eddie Murphy. They don't care. They pay the damn rent. They want their rent. They mm -hmm. want their thousand, two thousand dollars. So I think um, really science and art have to go hand in hand. There is a formula for things. You really have to know that if in order to continue doing this, you're going to have to learn to survive. Some people have a day job. Mm -hmm. They're a teacher, and they're also very successful at playing the drums on the weekend in a band mm -hmm. because that's what they want to do. Yes. Some people um, quit their jobs and go into something and then realize, you know what? This it's isn't what actually I what I want. Yes. And this is not what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back. For me, I guess um, I, I rid myself of a lot of worldly needs, physical, material needs in order to do this so in order for you to do your journey you chose to be frugal yeah like as a conscious decision 
Yeah. I'm going to cut back my expenses. Yeah. To go further. Well, it went from cutting back my expenses to having no income. Okay. For some time. So I really just had to think, how am I going to survive? On, and to when can I survive on these savings? And of course, when you're 20 something and you're in another country like Iran and you're making films there, you don't care about how much money you have left in the bank. Somehow, you know you, you're going to make it. Mm -hmm. And that's how I felt. That somehow, I'm going to make it. Somehow, I'm going to make the money. Somehow, the money will come. How did you support yourself throughout your journey? Did you have to take, did you take side jobs? From my journey as of when? From university time? Just, just, just across the board. I guess the reason I'm asking is because my brother told me this. And I remember when I was going through a tough period when you know, we lost everything. And I was like, hey, but I've got a goal and I've got a vision. And this is what I want to do. And he goes, yeah, but you need to learn to do whatever you have to do so that one day you can do what you want to do. Yeah. And he literally had to say it again because he clearly realized that the first time didn't sink in. Yeah. He goes, don't talk about no vision. Right? No one cares. If, you know, if you're broke, you're not going to be creative. If you're broke and you can't pay for your rent, you won't be able to pursue a vision. And it is true. Like, do whatever you have to do. Do any job. Take up a job. Do something. Yeah. Get yourself to a position where then you can use it. You've got, the enough, you've got enough cushion. You've got the catapult yeah. to be able to then pursue what you want. And it is true. Because you have to. Because you have to. I guess I went through a time when I decided to leave Australia and go to Iran. I really didn't care what I was going to eat or how I was going to live. Mm -hmm. As long as I got to make those films and I got to experience what I experienced mm -hmm. in Iran. Then when we, obviously when I co-found the company, we started working and we started earning an income from the advertisements and stuff. So what you say as a side job is very different to when I was at university and I was working in a fitness club. Sure. To when we started the company and I was doing side jobs such as commercials that I wasn't crazy about. It's a pen commercial and the client has 5,000 euros to make it. You know, but we but know- it help sustain that engine. <coughs> That's right, excuse me. We, we have the cash flow to keep going and then we take on a, a razor company and then we take on, you know- Things you're on, super passionate about. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, to this day, the biggest directors in the world are still doing this, you know. Yes, it's all great that you, you're, you know, you're doing a BMW commercial with Madonna. It's huge. But why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. You know, is it a side job? Is it a passion job? Is it both? You know, you do get to that level where you get to choose sure. what you work on. And I did get to that level eventually. Now, we're at a situation, like the world is in a situation, a situation where, you know, if, if it, I don't know if this cup company comes up to me and says, can you come up with a creative idea and we'll give you exact amount of money? I'm going to think about that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say no. Yes. You know, because in order for me to continue making my film, that's maybe not paying me yet. Sure. I need to do this. Sure. And so when you make the point about homeless people, I think I made the conscious decision to be homeless in that sense when I decided to leave Australia because I left everything associated with comfort behind. Yes. And I was used to doing that already. But again, it comes down to that clarity. You had that clarity that I'm going to do whatever it takes. I emphasize on clarity because from the outside, it can you know, easily be taken, like it just looks like everything can be taken for granted, that everything just worked out for you. And yeah. You know, you just literally just turned up and things have been served to you on a silver platter. I think when you look at things in hindsight, you tend to talk about patterns. Yes. And so if I really go into the many rejections, the days, the nights, I was rejected by an extras agent. That was my first ever real rejection because they said, quote, unquote, you have too much passion to be an extra. I swear to God, that's what they said. They said, you're not going to be compliment. problematic. You're going to be problematic because you have too much passion. Because see, the extra is not supposed to be asking questions or doing things. I was, you know, Stay in the background like exactly what they said. They said, you have too much passion to be an extra. So that an extras agent refused me. What went through your mind when that happened? <clears throat> 
They're right. I did take it as a compliment, but it was also, um, it was a, you know, an, an extra boulder in my way that I didn't need because I knew that they had access to a lot of good uh, productions. Um, what did you do? I'm, I'm, see, I'm interested in this because the reality is whatever we choose to do in life, to this day I face rejections and I expect to face rejections no matter how great I am or whatever it is that I do, it's just a fact of life. The same with you. But, but men are generally better at dealing with rejections than women and that's because okay. we are raised that way. I mean in this generation anyway. We are raised to not be rejected. Just like women, you know, when you look at the, in the industry of film, women were always the desired and men are always the hunters, mm -hmm. even, in, in, even in, in film. So men are used to hunting and getting rejected, hunting and getting rejected, approaching, no, approaching. We don't like it, I can tell you this right now. Excuse me, yes, but you have a better mechanism at, at dealing with it than we do. How did you deal when you got rejected? I dealt with it like a man. <laughs> yeah, if that works, yeah, straight up. No, well, I mean, I, I just, you know, I just looked at it, okay, well, I guess this wasn't the right path. I guess this was, this is not right. When I got rejected, for example, from the extra agent, I was like, you know what, good. Because I, I'm not going to go back on my passion. Just because you rejected me. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I did the that... film course. You okay. know, so I did other things. So I went and started working. Uh, behind the scenes is whatever I could do, whether it was sound or whether it was gaffer, or whether it was 20th assistant camera, or whether it was um, wardrobe, sets, assistant director, whatever I could do. So it kind of, that rejection pushed me to think creatively about how to solve my problem. Mm -hmm. So what's the best way to do this? You know, and I still did the extra stuff, but I also did the other stuff. The, the other rejections that I have had have been, you know. No, no, go on. No. Uh, clients, um, you know, you, you put so much heart and soul in something that you create for them or that you want to do, and they're like, no, actually, you know what, no, not you. <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, you, you I mean, it's when so I was trying to, to get personal, funding, though, yeah. yeah, of course, when I was trying to get funding, especially when you're very close to your project. And I think people just really, confuse things. We all play a role in this world. We all have a role and there is a bigger picture and you are just a small part of this bigger picture. It is, you are the protagonist of your life. You're not the protagonist of earth. So when, when somebody is rejecting you, it's a reflection of them. It's a reflection of what they want. It's a reflection of you. If you really want that, go for it again. Keep going for it. Go again, go again, go again, keep going. Tom Cruise was rejected by 59 agencies. Interesting. There are, there's so many stories like this. You know, I think 59 was about 59, 89. Who, who taught you this, this attribute of being relentless? Because that's what, you know, that's, that's, that's what I'm thinking when I'm hearing you speak. Like this chick is just relentless. <laughs> Possibly. It's like she don't, she doesn't get no. Like to you, it seems like that no doesn't even exist. Like it's muted. Yes, you're right. Absolutely. That's I don't what comes get across. no. I don't get it. If, if for example, <laughs> if somebody says no to me, I see that as everything. But the no, that's so. Actually, the other week, uh, I, I've, I've been going through a really difficult time with work. Funny enough, right now, for the last couple of months. And one of the closest people said to me, I can't believe you're still doing this. I would have given up by now. And you know, when the closest person or people to you say stuff like that, it makes you think for a second, Shh, are they right? Mm -hmm. Should I give up? Mm -hmm. Why am I still doing this? You know, for example, this, this road that I'm trying to take, like <clears throat> the documentary before the BBC took it up, I had approached so many funding bodies to fund this documentary no one would come near it because it's a scary story to tell. And, and I, I was a first time director in that sense. And they didn't know how to take this risk. I think it was the passion that, that, that the, the content um, head of BBC World saw in me, plus her own skills. Because when you trust someone with something, you're trusting yourself enough as well, mm -hmm. because you know you're the guiding, 
you know. So when I put, for example, when I hire somebody for something, I give them that trust because I know at the end of the day I, I can pick it up. So people who didn't trust me, I realized were not trusting themselves. That's an interesting This was a very big thing for me in my industry because there were many times when I proposed things to people and I knew it would be a success. And today they look back five years and said, I wish I did what you said, Pega. I wish we created this content. I wish we did this. But their decision was not based on you. Not completely. If if 50% me, it was 50% themselves. Because I know that if I start something with somebody and I know they're not as... They've never done this before, as an example. Okay, they've done a great line of work, but not this particular thing. I know I can go in and pick it up. Or I can find the resources to pick it up. So trust myself. Mm. And so for two years, I, and literally, I was I had housemates. Everybody was involved in the proposals that I was writing for these films. I remember my housemate used to leave in the morning and go to work. And I would be sitting with a coffee on the computer. I should come back eight or nine hours later, maybe even after dinner. And I was sitting in the exact same spot. The only thing that had changed is maybe my clothes because I had a shower or whatever, I went to the gym or something. Exact same spot, still working on it. Because the one thing that drove me was my, and people always tell me that your passion and your um, obsession is not good. But I am a, I am an obsessive person. I'm obsessed when I want to do something. I'm obsessed with it. And when I'm not obsessed with it, it doesn't work. <laughs> you know? So, yes, you're right. I'm relentless. I don't hear the word no. Where does it come from? Probably from the time when I knew I had to be self-sustained. I had to push myself. I didn't have the support of my family mm. because they didn't like what I was doing. And I was very young when I realized this is going to be tough. I'm on my own. Yeah, and then they, they, they slowly came too. So, I Am Yazidi gets picked up by BBC. Mm. That's the good part. Mm. Did you count the rejections? No, because I didn't focus on the rejections. What would you say, approximately? In the tens? Ten? Yeah. Nine or ten? And you know, I, I also, this might become a bit spiritual or whatever, but I also believe that the universe really starts moving towards you when you want something. Because the lady who introduced me to the head of content in the BBC dropped by in our office to meet my business partner for something else. Not even related to me. Mm -hmm. She lives in Spain, in Madrid. I mean, by chance, he said, you know what, you should really meet Penny. She's working on something. She saw the trailer and she said, I've got to do something for you. I can't let this just be like this. You've got to come to London. But had you quit or had you stopped this this chance encounter, which I don't believe in chance, I'm also with you that if, if you're constantly you know, being relentless with your pursuit, then the world conspires to help you out. Yeah. But this chance encounter happened because you were relentless. Yes, because I created that trailer regardless of my rejections. I knew this had to get out there. People have to see this. And Again, it wasn't, I never imagined in my wildest dreams that I would work with the BBC because I was never even interested in it. But my film found a home there and in the hearts of many people who watched it. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you're right. Your mom said something to you in Persian when you were making a decision about wanting to take on a world dominated by men. Yeah. Could you tell us what it was in Farsi and then tell us the story behind that? Yeah, I was very young, actually. Very young. I'm hoping I'm asking questions that you haven't spoken about before. I've never years. spoken, but I did speak about it at that. Uh, I know, and you were talking. Yeah, because so. you were there. Because <laughs> you helped me with that. Um, <clears throat> so when I was young, I remember I didn't... First of all, I didn't care about whether I'm a man or a woman. I think, I didn't think, even now when people say to me, female filmmaker, I'm like, who cares? It's why women filmmaker and women empowerment and all this? I didn't think about, I, I never thought, am I a man or a woman? 
of course, you know, you're one thing and you're attracted to another thing, whatever that is. But I didn't think of myself in a limited way. Even though I grew up in a Persian household where, you know, we had to dress a certain way, we had to, you know, be aware of certain things. It was my dad, he was very strict. But when it came to other things, he was always like, don't ever think you're different to a man because you're not. This was my dad, you know? And that was the seed he instilled. Yeah, I guess. I guess. And, and my parents, honestly, I don't want to take the credit away from them. It, I didn't become this way because they didn't support me. I became this way because I watched them as well. Mm -hmm. And even at the age of now, my dad is 66. He still acts like he's 25 and he still does the same thing. Good stuff. And my mom as well, no matter where she is, she'll start something. She'll go, you know. I remember there was a time when I was really down and out and I looked at my friends and I was like, wow, they're really going for it. You know, they're really doing their thing. And my mom to this day, you know, she's got a pacemaker and she, she still goes to the gym, she still lifts weight, she still goes swimming, she still, you know, they, they in, in their own way, my dad would never step foot in the gym, but you know, in their own way, they have that thing that they don't stop doing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, that, and that does help. And I think all parents should really think about that when they have kids. <laughs> um, so, well, I was probably 12, 11 or 12, no, I hadn't gone to high school yet. And I said to mom, uh, we were in the kitchen. And I said to her, um, mom, I want to be better than the book. Okay, so I had this thing that I really wanted to be the first woman to land on the moon because I wanted to be an astronomer as well as the acting thing. But anyway, uh, and I said to her, mom, I want to be better than the boys. I said, are you crazy? The world is run by by the boys. And that for me was an immediate click. Oh, hell no, I have to prove this wrong. I have to show my mom she's wrong. At 12? Yeah. It was like, I have to show the world, not just my mom, because my mom obviously didn't believe this, because she was had started working when she was really young, and she was a go-getter and all this, but it just instilled something in me. You know, my dad saying, you're no different to a man. My mom saying, the world is run by men. This just made me go, oh, hell no. Me being a woman is never going to stop me from doing what mm. I want to do. What stood out about what you just said is the fact that you don't see yourself as a female writer or a female director. You just see yourself as a director. Yeah. And what, I'm, what I really like and I've, I've noticed it now is when I speak to, and I've spoken in universities or I'm speaking at schools or when I'm speaking to parents and, and I see their kids, it's really obvious that whatever maybe maybe females in my generation have faced in terms of challenges, but what I've realized is all the stuff, this conversation that's happening with, with women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, this is not the conversation that's happening Good. You know, with, with the next generation, with the generation that's coming up. They, they all have this mindset. Good. Hey, I'm a filmmaker. I'm an Instagrammer. I'm on Facebook. Yeah. My gender is male. My gender is female. No difference. Yeah. I'm an attorney. Yeah. Some of the most powerful people I know are women, and they share that attitude. They don't see themselves yeah. as women. We are better than the men. The men are better than us. They don't even. It's just <clears throat> not in their thing. They have a goal. They have that seed. Yeah. You know, using your analogy, and they're going. This is the journey that I'm traveling. Yeah. You know, I'm just living it. And yeah, and you know, I faced this in Iran. The first thing I faced was that the crew didn't trust me. Because first of all, I looked a lot younger than what I was as well. So they were like, who's this little girl who's going to come and do this production? So I really had to, as a woman, really win their trust. As a man, probably as well. But I realized this later on, that it was because I was also a woman and I was new and all this that I really... And number two, they said, you're, you're very manly. No one has ever said to me, if anything, everyone has always said you're so feminine. Mm -hmm. so no one has said to me that you're very manly. It's because they associated that go-getter, relentless attitude with yes. being a man. Yes. With acting masculine, with being manly. And so when they used to say to me, I don't get it how you can be this, but you're so very manly. I was like, what does that mean? Will you shout on set? Well, of course I'm going to shout on set. That idiot over there is like still putting up the light. Of course I'm going to hurry up, you know. 
you know, I'm yeah. going to go, hey, Ali, we're ready to shoot or whatever it is. Because my assistant director is sitting there fiddling with something. You know, I have to shout, for example. So, you know, or I would pick things up and then let directors don't pick things up. I'm like, I don't really care what directors, you know, do. I'm going to pick that up and I'm going to put it over there because no one else is doing it. But what's interesting is that attitude, again, it's, you know, having that attitude attracts a certain level of behavior. When you have an attitude of, hey, I'm just doing this, doesn't matter if I'm a male or, yeah. or a female, then that's the energy you put out. And that's perhaps the energy you get. Kind of like people that say, I have a lot of drama in my life. My first thing to them is, I don't feel sorry for you. You've attracted the drama. You're seeking the drama. I don't have any drama in my life. Sure, my middle name might be Dick, <laughs> and I might not have friends, but I'm super clear about it. I don't want drama in my life. Guess what? There is no drama in my life because my attitude is no drama, which means that my behavior, my decision making, my actions all says no drama, which means all the vibes that go out there doesn't attract, doesn't fit with the puzzle of people that have drama. They stay right the fuck away. Yeah. What have you resisted for a long time, but then had to change in order to progress? I asked this question, and I'll tell you where this question has originated from. This YouTube show and podcast, I've been procrastinating about for five or six years. And I know I should be doing it. I know that I've got a great network. I know that we can have great conversations. I know we can create great content that people can benefit from. Then I feel like doing it. It's going to be a very different answer to what you probably expect. I don't know what to expect. Self-love. Interesting. That's what really, really got me, got in the way of, of me achieving the things I want to achieve and becoming the person and really just, because see, I naturally love the people around me and I naturally want to give them things before I give myself. There are a number of things, self-belief, self-love, when I talk about my story and when I'm telling you about what happened and how I got through things, you naturally think I am believe in myself, yes. I love myself, yes. I, you know, but I did it. It wasn't that, it wasn't ever the fact, yes, I do believe in myself a lot. And I believed in myself from the start because I just knew, you know, I just knew I wanted to do this and I had to do this and there's no other choice. I didn't give myself but the self-love part is the part that suffered the most. Okay. Because, and I think that that really got in the way of things because sometimes I would have the ability or the opportunity to do something and I wouldn't do it because I didn't want to hurt the people around me. Okay. So what was important to me was not necessarily what made me happy, whether it was for film, for business, for work, personal, it, it was how can I do something that doesn't hurt this person? Your decision was based on others. Loving others more than sure. loving myself. They're putting their interests first. Yeah. And then where was know. the moment where you had the flip? I think there were a few times in my life where I realized, okay, no one, no hand is going to come down and pull me up mm -hmm. unless it's my own. Yes. And well, that so. hand better be a loving hand. <laughs> you know, it better it better really just really help me out of wherever I am because I realize that most people are not like me. <clears throat> and this goes into a completely different film it kind of leaves the whole filmmaking thing. But I realize that most people are not thinking about me over themselves. Everyone generally is just self-interested. Which I was never. Okay. So then I realized that in order for me to get anywhere, I don't need anyone else. I need me first and foremost, me, you know, and in order for me to have me, I need to love me. It's not about, oh, I express the self-love and, you know, watch your hair and happy yourself. All of those things are expressions of self-love, mm -hmm. but real self-love comes from an understanding, like you said earlier, that you can do things in a certain way or that you can uh, benefit someone else 
it's not that you choose not to benefit them, but you choose to benefit yourself. Mm -hmm. You choose to treat yourself like that child you're treating everybody else mm -hmm. like. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, and also the thing that really um, got in the way as well was not necessarily ego, but maybe a bit of pride and a bit of shyness. You know, as I said, like when you look back at my story and the way that I'm telling you it, you think, yeah, she went out. She... But I'm sure had I not been a little bit shy, which I am, I would have gone even further. I would have got even more. Well, was there an experience where you go, okay, that's it. You know, we all have these defining moments in our lives. You know, I had a defining moment where I go, we're doing this podcast. Yeah. I had a defining what moment. What was that? For the podcast, it, it was a week where I was getting people from New Zealand, Australia, my brother from Dubai, uh, Poland, Netherlands, all in one week. Um, Slovakia, States, and a few from each of these countries. So it was literally a week of 15 or 20 messages. And it all had something about along the lines of, you should do a podcast. Why don't you have a podcast? You should do a podcast. So you the Why don't you have a podcast? Exactly. The signs were there for a long time. But and you have to change. I mean, it's 100%. A, it's a yeah. bit of a cliche, but if you want to get where you've never been, you have to do something That's you've simple. never done. A defining moment when I lost 20 kgs was my ex, and she had absolutely no negative intentions. I don't believe she had that. Was a few years into us dating, and I was like, well, fat Humpty Dumpty, she looks at the picture and she goes, oh, wow, you used to look really sexy. And she shouldn't mean, I don't know, she didn't mean anything, but it kind of just came out. Yeah. But I got the message, and to me, that was like a dagger to the heart. That was a defining moment. That evening, I went to the gym. Within a few months, I lost 20 kgs, and it's been over a decade now that wow. I've just kept this lifestyle, yeah. but that was a defining moment. Like, you, you go, okay, no more, I'm making a decision. Yeah. Because the times where we're not doing stuff, that's actually the toughest when you look back, it's the indecisiveness. Yeah. It's taking up all your energy, you're confused, you're lost. Yeah. But when I look at successful people or when I'm talking to people, individuals like yourself, people who are achieving, even when you make a decision and it's wrong, you keep going. It feels so good. You yeah. feel so light. Yeah. You progress, even if you're doing the wrong decision because you will correct and make another decision. But the fact that you make a decision, from there on, it's it's a smoother path, or at least it's a path that you can see, yeah. because then everything is in line with that decision. That's right. So, which leads me to that question: What was that defining moment where, from putting people's interests first to going, okay, from this point on, this is how it's going to be? Failure. It was failure. Mm -hmm. um, when I. It could have been the flip side. It could have been a great success. Okay. But it was it was that moment when I realized I am doing something that is not close to me. That is not who I am and that is not close to my heart and it's not taking me close to my goal. And going back to that seed, why am I in this country? Why am I in this region? Why did I come here? What am I doing here? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's really that moment where I, when I realized Maybe no one else saw it as a failure. So when I say failure, it's not like um, we lost money or that the production went bad. It's not anything to do with that. It's when I felt that I failed. Mm. So I looked at something and I saw it as a complete failure, whether it was the relationships that I had, whether it was the, I mean, we're talking about specifically work. Sure. So, so the relationships that I had within my work, the people that were around me, the content that was coming out, mm -hmm. it was that feeling of failure that mm -hmm. always, and I never knew this until now, <laughs> that that's when I realized, you know what? I am sitting here completely by myself because what I did was a failure. Mm -hmm. And it could have been a great success. Mm -hmm. And it, many times it was a great success. But to you, on the inside. Like when I decided to go to Iran, we had great successes. The company was good, the pay was good, the films were good in everybody else's eyes. To me, I was failing. I wasn't doing something that excited me, mm -hmm. that made me 
it that elevated me, that made me go, wow. And when you have failure like that in your mind, it naturally, like you said earlier, it spreads, it's contagious. Mm -hmm. If you put out a, a, an energy, the same energy comes back mm -hmm. to you. So then I started feeling really mediocre. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, all my life, when I was younger, I tried to stoop to a level where everybody could relate to me or come to a level where everybody could relate to me. And then now I'm actually at that level. Jesus Christ, I, have I need to stooped. change. Yeah. <laughs> I need to change. I need to climb back up to what I am, what I want to do. That climb back up might be a climb down for some people, depending on how they're going to measure your success, whether it's money or a great film or whatever it is. But I know that a lot of people that know me do not measure my success by the car that I'm driving. Mm -hmm. In fact, the better the car I'm driving, the less successful they see me as because they know what's inside. They know me deep down. Mm -hmm. They know that that's not... That's not it's what driving me, pun intended. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Since you you brought in the pun unintended <laughs> drive, what drives you today? So pick up today towards the coming ten years. What's that driver? I think it's really to move into the next phase of my passion. I don't like to say career because when people say career, you think of I always think of someone on Wall Street. Fair <laughs> that's, that's your story. You know, that's kind of what people think in a career. Uh, but it's really to move into the next phase of my creativity and to really explore and push myself out of this comfort zone that I'm in now and to really better myself, to really become better at what I'm doing and to be able to tell stories that really touch people on a mass level that a lot of people can connect with. I think the best films that I've seen are the ones that I watched back at different ages and found a completely new film in. You know, I want to be able to tell, you know, my next film, I want everybody to be able to take something away from it, then come back to it in 10 years and go, oh my God, an example. I mean, you say you put energy out and you get it in. One of the films that really inspired me when I was young was a film called The Never Ending Stories. The Never Ending Story. Lo and behold, I am now very good friends with the man who created all those um, caricatures. Wow. You know, and he's done amazing, amazing work in his lifetime. But, you know, or I'm friends with Yoda, is another, you know, from Star Wars. And now I'm friends with the man who created Yoda. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, these are all crazy to me. I think, oh my God, you know, these, these, are, these are what influenced me, what drove me. And somehow I brought that energy back. But, you know, when I go back to the never ending story now, I remember seeing it as a child and what drove me, what, what really inspired me. Now I go back to it and I see all these you know, all these metaphors that adults can really take away from. Like, for example, there's a, I don't know if you know this film, but there, there's a boy and his horse, and they're going through this valley of the dunes or something. And the boy says to his horse, don't believe in what you're seeing because you'll sink. If you believe in it, it will drown you. And the horse started getting depressed, and then the horse went into quicksand, and the horse died. The boy, who wouldn't believe that that was the truth that he was living, survived. You know, so when you look at this as an adult, it's a very different film Older to when you saw this when you were 12 years old or 11 or 10 or 9. So I think these are the sort of films that I want to continue making. Mm -hmm. And I, I really want to be able to emotionally connect with my audience because at the base, all humans of every culture are the same. We are all the same. And we can connect in the same way. We may be, you know, living in different colors. That means living in different uh, cultures, you know, colored in a different way, our experiences. Are different. But we're all the same. So that's my next 10 years. Yes, getting married, having children, all that as well. <laughs> having a big car, horses, helicopters, all that. I was going to ask you the question that um, apart from your films, what film inspires you? and you mentioned one but what would you say are three films that or movies that people should watch based on you know them being great movies or perhaps great stories but something that they could learn from 
I think if you look at it depends on how you look at a film. So I think Fight Club for me is an amazing film mm -hmm. on many levels. I think uh, I mean if you if you go back, you know, there's so many. My God, there's too many. You know, you could say A Separation by Oscar Farmer. You could say E. T. You could say um, What's the film that I recently watched that I was really wow? Well you could say Apocalypto by Mel Gibson. You could say there's so many. The, the thing is, what are you basing your favorite film on? I can't do that because there are way too many films that are great, mm -hmm. way too many directors that are great. I can't even say, I mean, when I was younger, I would say, yeah, David Fincher is my favorite director, Steven Spielberg. But now I look at these directors who are even one, one hit wonders. That person in that one hit wonder put everything he or she had mm -hmm. and it became this amazing film. So you can't I can't really give you a top three. I don't think it's fair to me to give you a top three. But there's a couple there that I gave you. I hope that suffices. It's probably five. Worst advice you've ever received. This industry is not good for a girl. <laughs> Best advice you've received, but then an act on. Stop looking for the gem. You are the gem. How cool was my intro? We did not. Yeah. <laughs> that intro that I did, I mentioned gem, and this was there was no plan on that. Oh my god, did you? Yeah. Did you? The intro. I got gem of a woman. Oh my god, you did. We we did not even talk about that. Yeah. That just came in my head. Yeah, yeah. It was that was that was what I received years ago and I didn't act on it. Say it again. Stop looking for the gem, you are the gem. But now you're taking that advice. Trying to, yes. It's hard, but I'm doing it as much as I can. Not limited to your industry? Of course, yeah. Um, who are some individuals that inspire you? Whether they know it or not. Uh, apart from me, you mean? You inspire me. Thank you. Um I have to admit that my family members really inspire me. Mm -hmm. I think I was, I'm really grateful and some friends who really inspire me because, you know, I don't look at someone's commercial successes or whatever. I see, you know, when you see people surviving and thriving in their own life, in their own story against all odds, mm -hmm. that's what really inspires me. So. You know, when I look at my brother, who's so authentic, so true to himself, no matter what the culture, people, whatever, I mean, his name is Hussein, and he's the least Hussein-like person you'll ever meet, <laughs> you know. Or, you know, my sister, who, oh my God, she's, you know, she's got two children, she runs a household, she's just, to me, a very successful person. Of course, everybody has their ups and downs. My parents, who against all odds, picked up with three children and went to Australia at the age of like 30 something and they didn't know the culture, I guess they knew the language a bit, but you know, and they just went because they want to give their children something they didn't have. Or, you know, and to this day I still, you know, my dad who's you know, he usually doesn't step out of character no matter what. <laughs> you know, I always look at the people around me and I really appreciate the people around me. Um, even, you know, my business partner, I mean, he just, he, he studied accounting and at the age of 17, he was hired by Fox and he grew so much that he was running channels for Fox. He was being sent around by Rick and Murdoch. You know, all these people who are around me, I find them inspiring. This gentleman I told you about, it's the still company, you know, you don't have to be Madonna. Of course, Madonna used to inspire me quite a bit when I was a kid, but you know, you don't have to be, you just, it's the struggle that people face and how they choose to deal with it. The brother of the girl who was murdered in my film, he now works in an NGO. He's fighting for human rights. I mean, these are the kind of people who really move me and make me think you have something and you're doing something with it. And I find that it's fine. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Family aside, who has helped you in whatever way? Again, you can take this in any direction. But who has helped you in any given way and they don't realize that they helped you? So only you can know and feel that they helped you 
in your time of need, whether it was a shoulder, whether it was just a hello, whether it was a smile, and yeah, whether, whether it was a referral. They have absolutely no clue about it, but it's memorable enough for you to I have to admit to appreciate it. every meaningful encounter I have had, whether good or bad, has helped me. Every single one. Whether it was someone who put me down or someone who put, raised me up in that sense. Mm -hmm. Whether it was someone who showed me the path or someone who distracted me from my path. In that way, they always helped me refine and define myself, my goals, mm -hmm. what I want, and really just filter through. I mean, there was a time when I deleted probably the 20 most important people in my life from the time that I was a child to my mid-20s. Suddenly, I deleted everybody out of my life. I no longer want you? Okay. Well. Yeah, I mean, my decisions to run after my dreams hurt a lot of people. Sure. And there were retaliations, of course. So, you know, there was a time where I felt that, you know, that negative energy is coming all the way from all around the world. It's doing a happy life. It's really reaching me and it's really touching me. And it wasn't necessarily, it was a selfish decision. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was my first act of self-love. <laughs> but I said, you know, I don't want this anymore. And... This is not something that's going to help me or you. Best we don't talk. Best we don't see each other. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, that helps me. Even. Betrayals have helped me. Friendships have helped me. Mm. I think Oprah Winfrey actually says this. She says, you know, there was a time when I was going through so much and I, real and I decided that life is my friend. And if you really look at that, I understand what she's saying because I'm the same in that way. I'm not as great as you know, what Oprah Winfrey is, but everybody's great in their own way. Sure. But, you know, if you look at that and you think, okay, every single encounter has helped me mm. refine, define, then I just came up with that, by the way. In this, in, this, in, this, yes, <laughs> in this interview, I've never thought about this before. Copyrighted. Hega <laughs> Yeah. You better not be stealing and shit. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, I mean, I just, I never thought of it like that, but it is, it is kind of filtering things out. You know, mm -hmm. I remember when I was younger and there was this whole taboo around having a tattoo. And, you know, I had some Afghani friends and she was like, my parents told me if I get a tattoo, certain amount of men won't want to marry me. And then she said, but. It's also a very good filter in the process, <laughs> you know, because once you do that, once you do what you want, the ones who are, you know, pushing you away, well, I'm not supposed to be part of your life anyway, because that guy's never going to get you. If you can't get the fact that a tattoo, you like it, it means something to you, or it doesn't, you just like it, whatever, you know. So, yeah, I think every encounter has helped me in that, in that, in that way. Of course, there's four or five people outside of my family who I can say, um, you know, this person believes in me before I believe in myself. Mm. Or this person said these kind words to me at exactly the right time. Or said the most unkind thing. I remember once I was sitting in a car with my friend at the time, and he said, you know what? You're never going to be anything. I remember this perfectly. And this was just when he was kind of raising up, and I just went, do <laughs> I was gonna say, get I have him. I slapped him instead. I was like, get out. You know, I didn't talk to him for years. And the last, and then the next time that I spoke to him, I was already an established filmmaker. Mm -hmm. You know, so that maybe that helped me. Sure. I'm not saying that my whole, you know, like Lady Gaga, for example, says, you know, my boyfriend said you never amount to anything and so she became this big thing. It wasn't that for me because I don't really look at it like that. I was already doing what I was doing. But you just pinballed your way. Maybe even in that situation. helped me. Sure. Pinball is the perfect way that I see it. Mm. Exactly the way that I see it. Mm. Spot on. Visually, exactly how I see it. Your future kids, yeah. nephews and nieces, you're able to only give them one piece of advice, teach them a trait or a skill, just one, to help them have the best life they can possible so they can live the best life possible. What would that one thing be? Skill, thought process, attitude, 
Yipnik. Believing yourself, know where you stand at the time when you want something and find a way to get it by using these two things. So you know your situation, you know where you stand, you know where you are in this grand scheme of things and you know who you are deep down. Mm -hmm. And then use these things to take you there. 500 years from now. I wrote a, I'm writing a film that's based on 500 years really? from now. Really? Yes. Interesting. <laughs> that I also did not know. But 500 years from now, however way history is going to be shown to the, to the generation at that point, it's going to read, Hega by Emmy was... Unfortunately. <laughs> that told the future through her films. Nice one. Yeah, maybe. That's my answer, and I'm sticking with it. Maybe. I mean, because you see a lot of films and a lot of books that were written way before the things happened. Sure. For example, 1984 was a book that was written in the 1930s mm -hmm. about what 1984 might be like. And in 2019, we are actually what he wrote in the 30s. Mm -hmm. So you never know. Um, but yeah, it would be something along the lines of through her, her stories are the timeless. You know, and that, and that they still, if humans stay the same, my stories will still be relevant to them. Nice. A question I might have not asked you that you would like to perhaps share with the audience. When I say when humans stay the same, it means if we don't travel out and start taking different shapes and form, and stuff. because we'll lose our hair, we'll start looking like what aliens look like. You know what I mean? You never know. If you live in space, everything's going to change. So yeah. Clarifying it. Just saying. If I haven't asked you a question that you'd like to share with the audience who are watching or listening to the podcast, uh, or a thought, a tip, or a piece of advice that you'd like to leave before we close. I would have to say practice self-love, an act of self-love every day, whether it's brushing your hair, whether it's reaching that friend you've been thinking of, whether it's sharing something with someone, whether it's giving something to yourself, whatever it is, practice that because that is what you will give to the world. Do you have an ask of our audience? Um, we're going to put all your links. Uh, where can they follow you on social media? So Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, my film works, my website, it's probably the best one. I would say my website because it will have everything. My my website, LinkedIn and Instagram is probably the And best. what's the website? Pegalaimi.com. We're going to place the link on the show notes. So both for the YouTube video and also in the podcast. Is there an ask that you have of the audience? Do you want them to check something out? Share your thoughts with me on anything that you see that's related to me. Mm -hmm. The reality is if we are open about it and leave our ego aside, every single one of us will have to agree that we have achieved what we've achieved and we will achieve what we will achieve in the future by standing on the shoulder of giants who have gone through this path, who have inspired us to blaze a new path, um, regardless of the field we're in. And no doubt it's been the same for you. And hand holding, not just standing on their shoulders, but holding their hand and saying, you know, Help. If someone reaches out to you and shows you that level of hunger, do not spam her. <laughs> Don't say hello, give me a handout. No, if someone comes up to you or someone shows you that level of hunger, that vision, but they need that hand holding, they need the guidance, can they reach out to you? Yeah, and many Should people Should they have. reach out to you? Well, yeah, and many people have. I mean, I've worked with lots of people who now have their own companies, um, who are now working in different places, LA, London, Dubai. Um, I've written, um, uh, what's it called uh, when you write a re re referral? Mm -hmm. I've re written referrals for people who are now doing their master's degrees in film in, all over the world. Um, yeah, I've, I've always done that. Whether it was someone who wanted to be an editor or somebody who wanted to be a filmmaker or somebody who wanted to come into the finance of films or producing, 
I, I have to admit that I have been able to change people's lives in that sense. And I'm very happy, whether I talk to them today or not, I'm very happy that they were able to experience certain things with me and that from that they were, they were able to springboard onto other things. Recently, I heard that uh, one of the girls that I had hired who actually came to Dubai to visit me is now buying her second home here, working in the industry. You know, so this makes me happy. Stuff. So, yeah. So, if you're serious about it, if you're listening serious. to this, yeah, serious. Only serious. Prove, <laughs> you can show your hunger and prove it, then peg up IME.com. Correct? Yes. We'll put the links over there for you. You reach out, you make the impression. Um, you know, no doubt. I mean, I found this to be packed with gems. Um, usually with the interviews, I go over them a second time because I believe that, like, I mean, I got so much out of this. Thank you. You're welcome. So did I. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but the second time around, I get so much more and I actually do a summary of notes, which we then make available on the website. But I take notes going over the video a second time and I go, wow, there's so much, but I truly got heaps of gems. So I really appreciate you making the time. Thank you. I know you've got Thank things you that you need to do. Me. I know you've got things <laughs> to do. Thank you for having me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to really explore myself and my background and my work in this new way as well and sharing your insights with me as well. My pleasure. Hey, folks, I truly hope you got, I got countless, countless gems, but I hope you got one gem that you're willing to be able to put into your life and take things to the next level, whether you're in the creative field or whatever it is that you're actually doing. Um, please watch this video a second time or listen to the podcast a second time. I guarantee that when you do it a second time, you will get even more gems. We covered a lot and the chances are you'll have some questions you want to ask. So ask your questions. I'll try and answer them. Uh, hopefully Pega will take the time and also answer them. But if there are questions that we can't answer or un are unable to get a chance to actually answer them, Perhaps you can suggest a guest that you'd like to see on the show next. And what I'll do is I'll ask them the questions and we'll get their perspective and their answers to your questions. So perhaps you want to suggest some guests. Speaking of guests, who do you think we should bring into the show that could add value to our audience or watching it on video or listening on podcasts? Uh, there is a gentleman by the name of Bharat Bhatia, who is actually Bharat, a, quite inspir inspirational to me. And he owns uh, the company Konara Steel. So, well, he, uh, we appreciate the referral. <laughs> um, Bharat Send Bhatia. This video. <laughs> yes, Bharat Bhatia. My name is Kevin Abdurrahman. This is an official invitation. We would love to have you on the show to share your thoughts, your tips, tactics, and wisdom with our audience. As you know, the intention of this show is not to show off. When I bring my guests and I tell them, the whole idea is that we can have a conversation and share thoughts, tips, strategies, tactics, or maybe just the fact that when we get cut, we all bleed. Just so that you're inspired to take action, face your fears, do what you have to do, and grow. I hope we were able to do that. I believe we were able to do that uh, with this show. With an, awesome, with an awesome friend, I'm so glad I can call her a friend, and um, have the opportunity to laugh with her. I hope you got inspired. I hope that you got informed and I hope that you get going. My name is Kevin Abdurrahman. This is How Do They Do It? Like this. <laughs> <laughs>